we'll start out with um, asking Dave to go through the meeting procedures. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for everyone uh, for joining us this evening for the June 15th regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, this meeting has been properly advertised in accordance with the Pennsylvania Sunshine Act as a virtual meeting conducted using the Zoom telemeeting platform. If you're joining us tonight as a member of the public or as an agent to speak on behalf of an agenda item, please enter your name, municipality of residence, and if applicable, the topic you wish to speak on uh, by using the chat feature, which will be located just below the word bubble at the bottom of your screen. In addition to the Zoom virtual space, the township's teleconference line may be accessed by calling the township's main line at 814-238-4651 and dialing extension 3799. Prior to commencing the meeting, I have just a couple of short logistical items to cover. First, uh, the public may interact with the board by unmuting their microphones when acknowledged by the chairman. Uh, I just ask that you please refrain from using the chat feature to ask questions or to offer comments because we won't have anybody that's monitoring the chat and your comments or question may be missed. Uh, also, if you're not speaking, if you could just mute your, mute your microphone to reduce some of the ambient background noise, that would be appreciated. Uh, and second, if board members are asked to indicate their name when motioning or seconding a motion so that minutes may accurately reflect the action taken. Uh, and finally, I'll do a roll call the supervisors to ensure that all members can hear and interact using the Zoom meeting. Uh, please indicate you're here when your name is called. Mr. Miller. Could you do that one more time? You're here. Thank you. I didn't unmute quick enough. Ms. Danini. Here. Mr. Mitra. Here. Ms. Strickland. Here. Ms. Stevens. Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you. First thing is the uh, citizens input for anything that is not on tonight's agenda. If anyone would care to address the board, if you're on video, give a wave. If you're audio, just let us know. Uh, seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes for the June 1st, 2020 board regular meeting. I, Laura, move to approve. Addie seconds. And I have okay. just one, one correction to make. Okay, Lisa. Um, on page seven, under staff and committee reports, item B was the TLU report. In the middle of the paragraph, I just wanted to note that that comment was not about Warner Boulevard. That was about the Shingletown Route 2645 improvements. Okay. More of an, not a correction, just an addition there. And I have one simple correction. There's one place where it says Mr. Strickland, which should be fixed. <laughs> I did not see that. Okay, anything else? Okay, all in favor of approving the minutes with those corrections, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion carries. Oops. Next item is under special reports, the COVID-19 response report from the manager. Thank you. Um, I have just a few items of interest to report. First, playgrounds in the township and around the center region have reopened as of last weekend, and there's signage posted advising the public to use at their own risk as the equipment is not regularly cleaned or sanitized. Those using the play equipment should just take a moment to read the advisory placards at each park for some helpful guidance on how to stay safe while using our playgrounds. Second, a public meeting was held this afternoon by the Center County Commissioners introducing and receiving public comment on the approximately $14.7 million in federal CARES Act funding that should be allocated to the county through the State Department of Community and Economic Development. Uh, I did submit a preliminary estimate of eligible expenditures incurred by the township in response to the pandemic, but the exact appropriation has yet to be determined. Some eligible costs include the purchase of personal protective equipment, sanitation of the municipal building, and related cleaning supplies and materials. 
Uh, examples of ineligible costs include lost revenue as a result of the pandemic, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later. Another potential use of the funding that I found interesting was public infrastructure improvements, such as enhancements designed to provide pedestrians facilities that accommodate appropriate social distancing. So I'll be further considering the application of some of these funds as a potential source to complete projects in Pine Grove Mills in the Northland area. Uh, the only stipulation is they have to be expended before December 31st of the year. Mute the speaker. On revenue, uh, the news has actually been better than anticipated. May's earned income tax collections equaled approximately $700,000, which is virtually on par with our prior fiscal years. Our real estate tax collections have also been on pace to meet budget. Our transfer tax in May did take an anticipated dip, likely the result of diminished market activity in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, while this month is certainly an anomaly, our overall collections for the fiscal year to date have been strong, even on real estate transfer tax. While it's still too early to say we're out of the woods, I can say that our revenue collections have been encouraging, and the finance director and I will continue to monitor our financial position in the coming months, and we will be prepared to recommend any adjustments to our current year's expenditures if need be. Uh, and lastly, while our offices remain closed to the public, I am planning on reopening the municipal building to the public by appointment only as early as yes, week. Uh, once a decision is made, I'll put a notification out via social media and on the township's website. A virtual town hall has been scheduled for Tuesday, June 30th, beginning at 4 p.m. Instructions to access the virtual town hall are posted on our website. Uh, the event will include representatives from township staffs staff discussing local and regional matters of significance in response to the pandemic and staff is currently working on scheduling a representative from the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development to speak at our webinar. Uh, and we'll also have an opportunity for questions uh, to, that were provided during the town hall. As always, uh, I end by saying thank you on behalf of myself and the staff here for your patience and understanding as we recover from this crisis. We'd be happy to answer any questions from the board of those attending at home. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Dave? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is University Area Joint Authority Report. I do not see Jonathan Dietz among our members, so I guess I'll call on our other representative. So I'm going to ask Steve Miller to do this. So <laughs> um, the, the main um, Main issues we've got going on with the uh, UAJA right now uh, actually involve Ferguson Township. Uh, the biggest project they have coming up is they're going to be doing a 537 plan special study on the Scott Road pumping station. Um, that station was built in 2000 and upgraded in 2007, and currently it uh, the pumps are not quite big enough to handle the uh, demand on it. I believe the, uh, uh, th there's not been a problem with them, but at this point uh, we're getting close to the maximum and without some changes, we could run into a, a moratorium where uh, DEP would not allow additional uh, hookups to it. So they are planning, they looked at a number of different possibilities, uh, the most economical of which was to upgrade the pumps and also to upgrade the sewer lines along uh, Bristol Avenue, the, the lines that it goes into. So that will be a project coming up. Uh, they'll be doing the study over the course of the next year and anticipated construction starting next fall. And, fall of 2021. I don't think it will be a real long construction period. The, the, the planning and design was gonna, is going to take a lot longer than the actual construction. But the uh, study uh, is gonna start fairly soon. Uh, connected to that is the Harner Farm uh, developments. Um, at this time, the, the uh, part of the Harner, Harner Farm that was on the south side of Whitehall uh, is uh, going to go down to the pump, that pump station. So that includes the area where Sheets is and the land development plan we've already looked at. They, they will not be able to tap into the sewer system 
until that upgrade is finished. So we will not be having any of the houses built uh, or you know occupied until the upgrade is finished toward the end of next year. However, the sheets will at their expense uh, are planning to put a pump station that would uh, run from the uh, sheets to the other side of Whitehall and then gravity feed again feed into the gravity line over there. That would not be a UAJA project, that'd be a sheets project. Uh, and it would have to be uh, abandoned once they do have the ability to tap into the regular line down to the Scott Road station. So it'd just be a temporary uh, line. Um, also under capital projects, they're looking at several projects to um, combine water and energy, one of which will be a residential uh, solar energy project that would bring uh, UAJA homeowners and possibly business owners and a developer together to uh, construct energy projects on houses that would benefit UAJA, the homeowner, and uh, essentially the UAJA would get uh, nutrient offsets for the energy production and the homeowners would get a lot cheaper energy. Uh, it's very early stages on that, but that's something they're looking into. Also looking into replacing the UV disinfection with ozone, which would save a significant amount of energy. And I see that John Dietz is here, so I'm gonna ask him if I missed anything. <laughs> No, well, uh, yeah, uh, but I just wanted to inform the board that, you know, uh, the board got a lot better looking with a new representative from Ferguson Township, so. <laughs> a little tongue in cheek. Uh, <laughs> Steve. Uh, we welcomed Steve Miller as a, a, as a new board member at UHA uh, two months ago. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, he did talk about the uh, residential solar panel. Um, UAJ is also, uh, installing another somewhere between 10 and 15 acres of solar panels on site uh, to bring them to their maximum amount of solar panels they, they can construct on site. Um, and then the, the, the solar panel residential, uh, as Steve said, the um, uh, UAJ has been working with DEP. And th this, this goes back several years and, and we were having a discussion regarding the solar panels that the, uh, um, and it, it, it basically came up or I suggested that they ought to look into nitrogen offsets for solar panels. So that really has evolved. Um, they've contacted DEP. They were initially eject, uh, rejected by DEP. Uh, they then went to EPA. EPA said yes, that the solar panels do offer the ability for nutrient offsets. Um, and that's pretty important. You, you know, that's, that's something that's come up repeatedly. Uh, with respect to UAJ and, and, and UAJ's motivations uh, to, to be able to continue to receive wastewater and meet their effluent limits is, is to meet nitrogen demand um, and be able to remove nitrogen effectively. So offsets are going to be part of that uh, larger picture to be able to provide the region with effective treatment in the long term. Uh, so that provides an additional solution uh, and method for uh, UAJ to meet it. I don't know if anybody's aware, but the the, the uh, Virginia and Maryland is suing EPA, which could all in all likelihood lead to um, even more stringent limits of nitrogen on wastewater treatment plants. Um, the, you know, it's kind of expected with that that the effluent limit for total nitrogen for UAJ could drop to as uh, as low as three milligram per liter. Um, if anybody knows that the water you're drinking out of the tap has about a total nitrogen somewhere between six and nine milligrams per liter. So in other words, UAJ has to lower the nitrogen to a level lower than what's in the drinking water. And um, as a result, that, that does create, uh, that becomes one of the most significant problems for UAJ and the, the, the treatment of the wastewater. Um, some of the other, uh, Items on it is uh, uh, UAJ is looking at um, getting a, a, an approval of a TAR from from uh, from the, the local townships, and that's basically to look at the beneficial reuse area and the beneficial reuse activities. It's 
it's on the agenda again this this month um, as far as dealing with that those aspects um, one of the things I'll just touch base on since I live here and, and I see what's going on also is the uh, uh, the Greenbrier demonstration project um, that the uh, UAJ continues to install um, connections to the all the mains are installed and they continue to uh, connect um, residential residentials with the grinder pumps to the, to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it was delayed by two. Uh, it was delayed by two months due to due, due to COVID. However, they did have permission to connect under emergency conditions uh, people who whose uh, septic systems has failed. And and this is an important note that this this has helped the the residents of Greenbrier considerably uh, since the start of the project. There have been twelve connections under emergency. In other words, their septic systems had failed. Um, it just seems kind of unusual that you have 12 fa failures in less than a year in a neighborhood that it was identified by COG as not having any issues. And I repeat that, any issues with septic systems. So as a, as a resident here, as well as other residents, uh, quite a few are, are very uh, happy with uh, now with the, with the project and, and the fact that the, these installations are going in place and, and probably saving them each about uh, $20,000 uh, a resident. So, um, did I miss anything else, Steve? Uh, that's, I think, everything that I've got on any notes I have here, plus some. Okay. So. Uh, if, if anything else to touch base is, is uh, uh, UAJ uh, every year goes through an independent uh, audit, and um, it, as, as usual, uh, the audit comes back clean. Um, you know, there are no issues with respect to uh, revenues and expenditures. And uh, generally, there's just a few suggestions on, on how to improve uh, control over uh, uh, monies that are flowing. And, and, and this year, there actually wasn't any, I don't think there were even any comments made as far as how to improve control. So um, with that, I'll take any other questions anybody has. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'll probably throw them to John. So, <laughs> Laura. Thank you. Thank you for your tag team report. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's in part, I, I apologize. I was, uh, I was late. I was having trouble getting, I had Zoom loaded on my computer, but when I loaded it from the site, it told me I needed a new browser, which I knew was. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> so, I, it just took me a few minutes to filter through it all. That's all. No worries. No <laughs> We've all been there, <laughs> exactly there. Mm -hmm. um, so my questions, first, the Scott Road pump station upgrade. So my understanding is that the residents of Pine Grove Mills essentially paid for the installation of that pump station and continue to pay for that on each of their bills. So that's my first question. Is that correct? That is what correct. Hang, okay. Then what happens next? And then my next set of questions I think might go to staff and we could possibly leave it to the planning and zoning director's report at the end, but I wanted to put it out there right now that I was under the impression that since the Toll Brothers occurred, we were all... Um, and I'm glad that John Deitch, you're here, and Steve Miller, as representative of UIJ, you're here, because I was under the impression that we had basically a checklist of things that were going to occur before a land development plan came to our table. And on that checklist was sewer planning module and any easements that were required for any kind of sewer, all of these things would be done before the land de development plan came to us. So now we have a land development plan that's passed that doesn't have any sewer that we knew that we needed this to happen for, but we didn't just because it didn't get coordinated beforehand, question mark. So um, we can work that out at the in the end, or you, you can answer it now. I think it's actually kind of a, Question for Ferguson Township staff, maybe. I can. I, 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 I can. I can answer the 
if I may, the question on process. So I think there's a couple of things here. Number one, um, I believe, Ms. Denny, what you're referring to is our um, adherence to, I should say, our methods for reviewing preliminary and then final land development plans. And that's something that we've always had in the ordinance. We've talked about um, you know, obligate being, you know, I guess obligating more uh, land development plans to go through that preliminary and then final approval process. So in, in that example, a preliminary plan would be approved. And one of the conditions of approval would be that sewer and water connections are established and any easements that may be required in order to make those connections or other kinds of utilities or essential services happen would be secured in place prior to the approval of the final land development plan. In this case, though, this was a preliminary and final subdivision plan. Orchard View kind of came in at uh, right when we were starting to talk about this revised process. So they did do a preliminary final in step with another as, as part of their submittal process because they had submitted this plan uh, long ago prior to, in fact, the adoption of the revised zoning and subdivision land development ordinances. Um, I, I do, I would have to suggest that I'm, I'm not sure that the um, comment that Orchard View is reliant on the upgrade to the Scott Road pump station to be completed prior to having any of those connections be permitted in that new development, because I, I just don't know that that's exactly the case. I know there's issues out at the Scott Road pump station, and that's the reason behind UAJA doing this special study but there's capacity, in my understanding, to service that new development as well, which would have been part of the rezoning process in addition to the approval of the subdivision plan. Yeah, if I can add, you know, I have a little history um, with UAJ and, and uh, what's true with uh, Scott Road uh, pump station. And, um, it, I can't hear you, John. Uh, is that better? Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, look at my picture. I was trying to get the light out from Blair, it's great. <laughs> and it just it didn't work out well. So um, the, uh, the the Scotts Road pump station has always been a problem uh, since it was initially constructed for UAJ. Um, you know, UAJ during storm events is still bringing trucks out. Uh, to pump down that wet well to keep it from overflowing. Um, it, it appears, it appear we, you know, we've had lots of discussions regarding the pumps and the pumps that were inadequate. You know, again, this was all designed according to requirements and approvals of PEP. Um, but the problem, the problems with uh, Pine Grove Mills uh, are numerous. I think it what was it about five years ago. We had a major storm event, uh, dropped about six inches in, in 36 hours. Uh, that that pump station got overwhelmed. Uh, there was backups in the people's uh, basements and Pine Grove Mills that were actually determined because uh, basically because they had there were a number of illegal connections um, in Pine Grove Mills. In other words, there were illegal. There are, and there's probably still are illegal connections in Pine Grove Mills, uh, where their, their basements sump into in, into the sewer system, which is which is illegal. Um, so there's, in other words, there's stormwater problems, and that's maybe something you guys can look at with with respect to Pine Grove Mills that, that goes into the Scotts Tunnel. I mean, this sorry, Scotts Tunnel is an AMD discharge that I work on. Scotts Road pump station. And so as a result of that, uh, UHA has decided to, to, to redesign and, and basically rebuild that, that pump station, um, along with, you know, as, as everybody said, approval of, of additional flows that will come into it. Um, so with respect to the, the residents uh, paying for that pump station, yes, they, they currently are continuing to pay for it. The problem becomes is, 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 is as upgrades and improvements have to be made to that pump station, that just that just extends the time period for which the uh, Pine Grove Mills residents uh, will be paying for it. That's my understanding. I can confirm that. Okay, so I'm going to ask Ms. Denny, 
but that's just my initial comment. So I'd like to actually have more dialogue about that. Um, I understand what you're saying about it being uh, built to specifications, but it's it's literally in it's in the floodplain. It's like it's in there, and it certainly wasn't the resident's choice to put it there. Um, but it's not I, receiving. I, I brought this concern up since really since the since this topic started to be even talked about it a little bit. I've brought this concern up and, and I appreciate you saying that because it is the first time that that has been the answer to that question in a very direct manner. So I'm gonna to have to think about that. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. I, I, I will add, I, I would like to add that just because that pump state, mo, mo, a lot of pump stations are located in floodplains. That does not mean that they receive a lot of infiltration and inflow. Uh, from stormwater systems uh, directly into the sewer systems because uh, UAJ has uh, very tight pipelines made of uh, PVC, not the old uh, concrete or clay tile types. When I'm talking about inflows, it, it, it is really related to, um, you know, some residential activities. It was actually, um, you know, I can say during during a meeting where, where residents came in and were concerned about it, all of a sudden they became not concerned because it, it was very clear that they had connections uh, to the sewer systems from the basement. And when we think about that, as far as flow getting into the system, uh, the flow from a, a, a basement sum can exceed the normal flow from a house by about a factor of 10. Okay, well, that is a good thing to think about, too, because immediately I think we should talk to the small area plan committee about this, because this is really the first time that that has been stated, even after this very long planning process with Pine Grove Mills. And so, um, also, I guess I would want to say that if that's the problem, then maybe the solution lies there directly toward that problem and then not upgrading the, the sump pump station. Okay, uh, I would I would say this is not the first time that's been stated because it's been a major problem since 2007. Well, and I didn't say it was the it, first time it's No, I mean, stated. it has been, there have been a number of times that we've been involved as a township in efforts to identify those places that are putting stormwater into the sewer line and a number of them have been identified, but there are also a number that apparently haven't been. That's, I mean, that that has been known to be the problem. The problem is it's hard to figure out where they are. I appreciate it's you been know. known by you or perhaps some others, but I guess yeah. at this point, I'm indicating it hadn't been known by that group that was doing that plan, and I guess it would be relevant. So. Yeah. It's it's not UAJ's policy to to go into homes and check to see whether whether there's illegal connection. No, but you have to communicate that because if, for example, a landowner were to per to sell their house and a new owner purchased it, they would have no idea that their basement was potentially causing trouble or potentially going to be flooded. Maybe if that wasn't indicated on the sale papers, which sometimes it certainly isn't. So I guess just keeping those lines of communication open and continuing to get that information where it needs to be is a good thing. And um, again, I want to not really keep talking about it. I appreciate all the help, but I think that I it warrants some thought, the whole thing and how it's kind of tied up in Harner. I'm not really understanding that. And I'm particularly interested because weeks ago, when the plan actually was passed, um, a resident approached me with this very question and the answer, the very question about the sheets and the orchard view and whatnot and hooking to sewer and the answer I think was different then. So I really need to, to think about it a little bit. So thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none. Um, get my Peter up here. Uh, next, we have the see that annual report. And Cindy is here for. Yes, for let's see if I can do this. <laughs> um, looking good so 
far. Okay. Huzzah, can you hear me? Terrific, okay. Um, thank you very much um, for allowing me to present to you. Um, it's my birthday, so I chose Ferguson Township. I chose to spend it with Ferguson Township. <laughs> um, let's see here. So I, I normally come to you every year and give you some highlights of the previous year, along with some great pictures of yourselves. Um, last year, we produced uh, 478 programs our tiny, tiny staff and our great interns. And it was also the final year of our 2017 strategic plan. So we'll be moving forward in some capacity with either rewriting that or updating it or perhaps starting from scratch. Um, Center Region Parks and Rec became a CNET member in January of 2019. And our newest member, UHAA, uh, voted to become a CNET member effective January of 2020. So we now have three authorities, the Water Authority, UHAA, and Center Region Parks and Rec. Um, the franchise agreement, very importantly, was uh, completed uh, last year. It was finalized and signed by the CAC in November and signed by Comcast in February. Uh, the agreement provides for some really important components. Uh, first of all, there is a subscriber pass through of 22 cents per Comcast subscriber per month that is forwarded to CNET for our capital needs. Uh, the franchise fees from the cable companies to the individual municipalities remain at 5% of Comcast gross revenue within your municipality. Um, we were allotted three additional uh, remote origination points or live connections. Um, there's a provision for us to have one HD channel in the future. And finally, it's very rare actually for um, stations like CNET to be included on the Comcast Digital Guide so that it actually tells you what is airing. It doesn't just say center government television. Um, so we are one of the few PAG organizations in the country that um, continues to have access to that digital guide. So Ferguson Township last year, there were 43 sponsored programs. A majority, of course, are the supervisors and planning commission meetings, uh, two a digital additional budget work sessions, and then one Spring Creek Watershed Commission meeting uh, was sponsored by the township last year. In addition, there were 61 bulletin board messages, and most of those are, of course, our agendas. Uh, we value the messages at one-tenth of a program, so the 61 messages add an additional 6.1 programs to your sponsorship. So you do all the math and you come up with a total of 49.1 programs. So last year in 2019, your township sponsored 9.6% of all of the programming by all of our member organizations. Um, it had been a little bit higher in 2018, it was a full 10%. So it went down just a bit to 9.6 last year. So this little graph shows you, it, it shows you pretty clearly where you started having your planning commission meetings covered. Um, so this shows you the last five individual years and the number of programs you sponsored in, in each of those years. Um, if you look back at the five year period of time between 2015 and 2019, the township sponsored about 7.8% of all of the programming by all of the members in that five-year period of time. In the previous five-year period of time of 2014 to 2018, the township sponsored just about 7%. And that five-year period of time is important because that, those are the years we look at in order to determine the following year's financial contribution as a CNET member. So your 2021 dues will be determined by your sponsorship in 2015 through 2019. So this uh, is a, a little graph that shows you all of the members 
and their percentage of sponsorship in that five-year period of time. So I have the red arrow there pointing down to Ferguson Township. So, you know, watch out College Township, you're coming. It won't be long before, before you will, um, before your programming will exceed possibly College and possibly Patton Township as well. So just to review for you, um, your meetings of course are televised uh, at the following times in the six days following a meeting, uh, Wednesday at 9 a.m., Friday at 6 a.m., Saturday at 12 a.m., and Sunday at 8 p.m. The reason I have the other times in parentheses there is Ferguson Township meetings air within a five hour schedule block. And so if your meeting would be less than two and a half hours long, your meeting would actually air twice within that block. So it's possible if you have a shorter meeting to not only receive four airings, but actually to receive eight. Um, planning commission meetings follow the same schedule, but on alternate weeks. Our website, of course, both channel seven and 98 are streamed on the website. And of course, the programs are there on demand for a minimum of 12 months with those wonderful clickable agenda items that the public really loves. Um, we are on Roku. Uh, people simply need to search for Cake TV and then look for the CNET logo. And just about three weeks ago, we became available on Apple TV. Um, people seem, simply need to look in the app store or CNET. I wanna stress that this does not apply to smartphones. It only is with the Apple TV set top box, not on cell phones, um, but it's another way, another way to watch the programming. So I know I've told you before, but it's worth, it's worth restating that I cannot ever give you numbers of cable viewers the cable company is considerate proprietary information and they will not release that to us or the public. I can give you some online programming data. Um, so I've listed here for you, both for the supervisors and for the planning commission in all 12 months of 2019 and the first four months of 2020, how many average, the average number of hits and then the median number of hits for the meetings. Um, so, um, you know, the supervisors get a significantly probably more hits than the planning commission, um, but uh, the planning commission is still coming in this year as an average of 74 uh, views per meeting. Um, so it's, you know, it's significant, I think. So, um, you know, we're just now beginning to receive uh, the first batch of those per subscriber pass through funds. Um, that funding, which is limited strictly for capital, will secure our funding for at least the next 10 years. And this really helps provide for the stability of your financial contributions because our members now really only need to provide operating expenses for CNET and are not uh, responsible or, or it, there's no demand on the members to prevent cap, to, to provide capital funding. We're looking going forward on increasing the number of over-the-top platforms that were available. We're looking at adding perhaps Amazon Fire next year. Um, and then finally, I had mentioned before, uh, we are looking to either develop an entirely new strategic plan or at least update the 2017 um, strategic plan. So the board will be looking to do that um, hopefully later this year. And that concludes that presentation. I know I went really quickly, so I'll be happy to take questions, I suppose. Okay, does anyone have any questions for Cindy? I can't see everybody right now, so if you do, just speak up. Okay, I'm not hearing any. Okay. okay. Happy oh, birthday. thanks. Yes, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well, it's always a pleasure working with the township. I should note that um, your representative to the CNET Board of Directors, Thomas Giles, 
uh, was was the president of the board for for many years, and he has stepped down as president. However, he is still your representative on the board. So thank you for giving him to us. Um, he was a wonderful president and still a great board member. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item on the agenda is under unfinished business a discussion of the draft zoning ordinance amendment domestic keeping of chickens and ducks thank you i'll ask jenna to introduce that on november 18th 2019 the board of supervisors discussed a request from a resident in pine grove mills to allow for the domestic keeping of ducks in residential zoning districts the consensus of the board was to exclude the request from the recently adopted zoning ordinance amendments and refer this to staff for further research. Um, we, staff has recently completed this research on this topic and we've drafted an amendment to the township's domestic chicken ordinance to include the domestic keeping of ducks. Provided with the agenda is the draft backyard chicken and duck ordinance for review and for an opportunity for the board to provide any questions and comments to staff. Okay, the you know, the action that we'll be asked to take tonight is to refer this to the Planning Commission. So this is sort of the first step of determining, do we want to move forward with it? So I look like, Patty, you had a yeah, question? Yeah, I, I was just curious. There was one thing I wasn't clear about when it said um, you could have six chickens or is it six of each or just six total? Six total. Six total, because that wasn't entirely clear to me. Okay. Laura. Thank you. Um, I have a question slash comment about the um, the line that talks about the zoning districts um, under standards number one normal agriculture and or farming practices found in the ARRA or RR zoning district shall be exempt from this chapter. So if I recall correctly, when we did the zoning ordinance update, we talked about how the chicken and, well, chicken and now chicken and duck ordinance um, would be the ordinance, the, uh, what do they call that? The ordinance that rules in terms of the RR small lots that are used for residential purposes. So when we say standards number one, our, our zoning district, we're more specific than that, right? because the chicken and duck ordinance will cover the residential lots of our, our question. I'm trying to go back to my conversations with Jeff about this because originally we were discussing what zoning districts to allow the domestic keeping of chickens and ducks. And he had maintained that we should leave it with single family properties and we didn't want to we didn't want to touch the um acres act and take and do anything with that so if i remember correctly the rr zoning district there was calculations included in the adoption of the zoning ordinance for um keeping of lot or animals on these properties Right. There were, there were standards for keeping of livestock, except in the case of chickens, the, the dialogue was specifically about how um, when you look at livestock, a large number of livestock would be naturally impossible on a small lot with a home yeah. because you rapidly meet your quota with one animal and we were good with that because it would talk to allowing 4-H. However, in the case of chickens, 
a three acre RR lot with a house, with another house in close proximity, could have a heckin' lot of chickens if you utilize the animal equivalent unit. And so we decided then when we were doing the zoning ordinance that, and we clarified, remember that was actually during the time where I kept asking this exact same question and it turned out that the chicken ordinance wasn't even part of the update, like we had forgotten to include it. It was during that time. Um, and then we realized, oh, we need to include it. And then it's like, which is which has primacy? That's it. Which has primacy in this particular instance? Because I was extremely concerned about that, making sure I wanted to allow that, but not so that it would become a nuisance. Okay. So I guess um, I think I'm going to have to make an agenda item specifically to talk this out, maybe. But I'm fine with passing this on to the Planning Commission with some sort of synopsis of that question comment. Yeah, and I can work with Jeff to get uh, some clarification on this. My unmute wasn't working. So. <laughs> Okay, are there any other questions? So Jenna will look into that as part of this process then and maybe we'll be looking outside it, we'll see. Uh, Lisa. Um, I was just gonna ask um, to have them look at the um, the water requirement to make sure that was adequate. It said that, you know, what size of, of water the ducks have to have access to to submerge themselves. So it just, you know, maybe they could look into that a little bit more to make sure that that's adequate. Um, and then I did have the same question about just clarifying the total number um, that's in number six under standards. Anything else? I'm not seeing any. Do we have a motion? I move that we forward this draft of the chicken and duck ordinance to the planning commission. I'll second, this is Lisa. Sorry. Okay, so we had a motion by Laura, second by Lisa. Any comment or further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye or yes. Aye. 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 Opposed signify by saying no. Uh, the motion carries. Looks like it's yours, Jeremy. So, <laughs> okay. Next item is the consent agenda. Um, the consent agenda we have one contract award, the special events permit, uh, acceptance of two voucher reports for April and May 2020, and four requests from board members for items for future agenda. Uh, does anyone care to pull any of those items off the consent agenda before we vote on the agenda? Uh, seeing none, do we have a motion? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. This is Lisa. Send you second. Okay, we motion by Lisa, second by Presenjit. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next item is a board member request that was approved previously through the consent agenda for a procurement policy amendment. And that was requested by Presenjit. So I don't know whether Dave wanted to introduce that first or have Presenjit do that. Actually, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the proclamation is next on the agenda if you wanted to get to that now or. Oh, I miss. Ah. Well, we'll back up. Uh, so there is a proclamation of the Township of Ferguson, Center County, Pennsylvania, declaring support for increased awareness of bias, diversity, and equal justice with anti-bias community relation. Thank you. Uh, Centrese Martin, the assistant to the manager, drafted the resolution, and I've asked her to introduce the item this evening. Yes. Can you all hear me? 
Uh, yeah, so in the last Board of Supervisors meeting, the board or specifically a board member requested for a proclamation on bias. Attached with the agenda, staff presents the proclamation on bias, declaring support for increased awareness of bias, diversity, and equal justice with anti-bias community relations. And I'm happy to answer any questions or I can elaborate if interested. So I would just say, um, you know, it's as a proclamation, we had some direction from the board in terms of the verbiage you were looking for, but, you know, we, we tried to get what we thought the, the important themes were, but if any board members wanted to offer amendments or modify the proclamation that could either be done and still adopted this evening, or if there were some, you know, serious edits that you wanted to work in and defer it to a future board meeting, we could do that as well. Okay, uh, Laura. I, just, I thought it was really well done, Centrice. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the agenda item. <laughs> Any other comments or questions on the proclamation? Okay. Yeah, I had requested that and um, she did a better job than I could do, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank okay, you. great. Uh, so Dave, this doesn't need to be, proclamation is not a uh, roll call, is it? Okay. No, a voice. Uh, okay, so I would take a motion. I'll move that the Board of Supervisors adopt the proclamation condemning racism and promoting cultural diversity and inclusion. This is Lisa. Resendit second. Okay, we have a motion by Lisa, second by Resendit. Any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, next is the board member request for procurement policy amendment. I don't know if Dave, did you want to start that or? Yeah, so I'll, I'll look to Mr. Mitra if, if you'd like me to introduce it or if you wanted to say a few things since this was your requested item. Sure, I, I can um, uh, say a few things and then you will possibly need to come in and back up the details and sure. Um, so. Um, yeah, so um, the objective here is uh, that I want to see that um, the board, when it tries to contract out to contractors, we are paying what at least I believe is a living wage uh, in a relatively expensive part of uh, Center County, which is uh, State College. Um, while it may or may not be the living wage, but um, so the idea is to see if we can pay um, uh, $15 an hour and only do big, you know, when we have, when we are doing bigger businesses, uh, we do um, our bigger contracts, then we do uh, make sure that um, people are paid at least $15 an hour. And towards this, I've had some conversations with staff and others and, um, uh, and so the, um, the solution that uh, tentatively we have talked about is that, well, uh, so preamble to that is that for, I believe, um, contracts which are more than $25,000 an hour, Pennsylvania has a minimum wage of, I think, $37.50. Uh, and um, that, um, Dave, there's a correction or? Oh, well, no. I. To, oh, I don't know which Dave you're looking at. It's no, no, uh, anyway, different uh, places. <laughs> yeah, I'll I let can you just introduce it and then we can sure. pick uh, yeah. flaws that I have in my understanding. So, um, so for $25,000 and up, there's a Pennsylvania uh, sort of minimum wage, which is, I think, about 37 and a half, and, and that's what they have to pay. Now, uh, below $25,000, there is nothing. And so my um, intent there is uh, for a certain number of these um, contracts, we pay uh, $15 an hour or more, or we ensure that uh, whoever is uh, working um, on our behalf or getting work done on our behalf is um, sort of not playing, paying slave wages or whatever uh, here. So. Um, so the point is, um, you know, do we do it for all? But then uh, it, we, it, we thought that if we do it for very small dollar um, contracts, uh, then perhaps the cost of the bookkeeping and so on uh, doesn't pay off. We don't get very many um, 
very many bids anyway. Um, so we might be tying our hands up. Um, so the things to consider here in um, there, there are several questions that I have gotten from constituents, which perhaps uh, uh, we should um, discuss is that is the um, is the township itself paying uh, $15 an hour for people whom we employ uh, directly. And um, is this really a problem? How many um, contractors, how many um, contractors are employing people under $15 an hour? Uh, and if we know that. Um, so, so this is where uh, I am uh, with this issue where I would like to have um, a minimum wage that uh, people pay when they do um, work on behalf of the township. So that's, and I'm, I'm open to questions, amendments and so on. Um, and I have some comments which I'll hold on uh, for later on too. So Dave, did you have, or either Dave, have some comments on this before we go into discussion? No, I, I think Mr. Mitra introduced it pretty well. Um, I, the, the one correction I think I would make to the, um, the point about the $25,000 an hour threshold. So Pennsylvania has a prevailing wage law that applies to um, public organizations and projects uh, whose amount is typically greater than $25,000. There's a different threshold that applies to road projects of $100,000, meaning that when the cost of the contract exceeds that number, uh, contractors are obligated to pay their employees on the job a prevailing wage, which is established by the Department of Labor. Um, I believe the, the approximately $37 an hour, I, I can't recall the exact number uh, offhand that Mr. Meech was referring to was the labor, uh, the most recent laborer rate, um, which is you know kind of typically like the, the entry level or, or base level position that you might see on a capital contract. So it's really just for uh, kind of an, purposes of an example. Um, I think typically, and you know, without having the schedule in front of me, but typically a prevailing wage job is going to uh, come in above that $15 an hour threshold that Mr. Mitra included in his agenda item. So board establishes its own procurement code um, it's in chapter one, administration and government of the code of ordinances. So you know, you're certainly free to modify it as uh, you feel is appropriate and in the interest of the township. Um, really below the, t the prevailing wage threshold or below $25,000, um, the uh, contracts that exceed 10,000 but are less than prevailing wage, uh, we are by the procurement code to get a minimum of three quotes. Uh, so it doesn't go through the formal contract and bidding process. It doesn't fall under prevailing wage law. And, um, you know, the township staff has a little more discretion in how we award some of those, you know, I'll, I'll call them smaller contracts. I mean, they're still above $10,000, so they can still be pretty significant. Um, and, but there's, you know, no requirement that we collect wage payroll certificates or that we verify uh, anything other than we get the quotes, we award the contract. Uh, sometimes it goes in front of the board if it's a board initiated item, or sometimes it might be a staff uh, award or award that I uh, authorize. So that's kind of what you're looking at. I, I put the um, uh, the applicable provisions of the administrative code that kind of outline what I just stated uh, as an attachment to the agenda and the highlighted language is inside. So, um, you know, this evening, if the board is interested in moving forward, I think the next steps would be for uh, direction to staff to prepare a draft ordinance amendment, at which time, you know, Dave and I could talk through some of our concerns or questions a little bit more. We haven't spent a great deal of time on this yet, given that it hasn't gone in front of the full board for uh, the thumbs up. But, you know, any questions that the board has that we're able to answer to or answer tonight, we can. Uh, Dave, I don't know if you had other Dave, anything to add to that or <laughs> just details that may not even be that important right now. So I can, I can help answer questions and add clarity, but in general, everything that you're saying is on track. Right. Any questions or concerns at this point? Um, I would ask, uh, do you have an idea, either Dave or Dave, uh, about how many contracts per year we would be talking about with this to fall into this range? And just a rough number. We probably put 25 contracts out to bid a year 
And I would say the majority of those are prevailing rate, but there's some big contracts we put out that aren't because it's considered maintenance, not capital work. So microsurfacing, that could be a $250,000 contract, but it's not subject to prevailing rates because it's been determined um, through the legal channels and with the Department of Transportation that it's considered maintenance, not capital. Um, there are smaller contracts that we put out that span multiple years that may or may not be involved. So, you know, we're, we're probably talking a couple dozen contracts, I would say, when we're looking at the smaller ones to the larger ones every year. Okay. Uh, Lisa. Um, Dave Modricker. So just to clarify what you just mentioned about contracts that don't um, have to adhere to the prevailing wage, but are above um, the limit that normally would. So this would not affect that. Well, I think what's being discussed is consideration that anything that's not a prevailing wage contract would be subject to this $15 an hour minimum. That's what I thought, but in, okay, I'm just trying to clarify because of the narrative, it's still, it said below prevailing wage law requirements. So if it's not under the requirement. Well, what's interesting with prevailing rate is we, we typically think of the threshold as under 10, 10 to 25, 25 and over. Over 25, we typically think of prevailing rates and that's where people get paid basically union wages. Every time we solicit a contract, we have to put in a wage determination to the Department of Labor. They then send us wage rates that are included in the contracts. And so those are typically the ones that are over 25,000. But in some years ago, there was another threshold established and that was $100,000 for transportation related projects. So now prevailing rates don't apply for a transportation project like road paving until you get to 100,000. There's also another um, criteria or threshold, and that's whether or not it's considered maintenance or capital. So something as simple as you might think I'm replacing a roof on a building, is that maintenance? Maintenance isn't subject to prevailing rates or is it capital? So the way you really get your question answered is you submit a request for a determination to the Department of Labor. They then tell you the answer and then you either include prevailing rates or you don't. So the other area we have Dave mentioned is work between 10,000 and 25,000. We typically get quotes, so it's competitive, but it's not as time consuming as putting a, a contract out to bid, so to speak. And we, we purchase based on, you know, the the lowest responsible bidder and below 10,000, we may or may not get quotes because we're purchasing in the best interest of the township. So sometimes if you're going out to procure something that's worth a thousand dollars, you may or may not go through the process of getting quotes. So my preference would be if, if everything else works out, then um, any of those contracts where, which are not covered by the state's prevailing wage but is over $10,000, we do the $15 per hour minimum. I think an, an easy example would be, let's say we award a tree planting contract for 35,000. It, you know, we can put a clause in there, minimum $15 an hour. What's a little that I got to figure out is, what do we do with other contracts like a uniform service contract that's $15,000 a three-year contract, does that mean the person driving the truck to pick up the uniforms pays 15, the person cleaning the uniform back at the shop pays 13, the administrative assistant pays 15. So we just got to figure out, you know, where we're drawing the line and what it pertains to. So, some things seem like they're easily understood. Others might take a little bit to figure out if they pertain. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm not sure that 
I'm clear, but <laughs> I appreciate your attempt. <laughs> well, let me, yeah, let me try again. Maybe ask it again. I'm sorry if I convoluted it. No, I think, I think it's, um, you know, one of my concerns was just that this was, um, you know, just the enforcement, the, um, the oversight of this might be complex. And so I just, not that it's not, um, you know, a positive step to take. I'm just wondering, you know, if maybe there's a, a different approach to take. And I had that same question that Prasenjit had brought up about um, payment for hourly Ferguson Township employees and COG employees. You know, I would like to know that they're all above that level before yeah. looking to- I, I can answer that question. Sorry, to, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I- No, that, yeah, thank you. Um, so we, we looked into this uh, probably about two years ago just to confirm, but we currently don't have any employees in Ferguson Township. I can't speak for the COG. In fact, I think when you talk about library employees you'll, or, or others, you might you know, be under that threshold. But um, you know, for Ferguson Township anyway, we don't have any employees except for our part-time seasonal landscape assistants who are below $15 per hour. Uh, there's also a uh, mechanic helper or, you know, I guess a temporary assistant mechanic that we typically get from the height, not get, but employ from the high school uh, in one of the tech programs and mechanics program there. Um, we pay that individual, but I don't believe we pay that person more than $15 an hour, but they're getting um, credit, credit for it as well when they do it in conjunction with their school program. So um, for the most part, Ferguson Township, you know, we, we've, we've addressed that issue. Um, even our part-time seasonal landscape laborers, if they're still below $15 an hour, which I'm not certain is still the case, they may be above it already, uh, it's right around that. Yeah, they're at 15. They are at 15, okay. So yeah. but even for them, it may have been true two years ago, but it's, it's not anymore, so. Yeah, that, yeah. I guess that the other question, that sort of brings up a question that I would have on this is with the type of projects we would be putting out for contract bids, uh, are the market forces likely to have people at $15 an hour to start with? I mean, are, are we really, do we know that there's a problem that we're trying to solve here or do we have any idea? I, I guess is my question. Well, I, I some vendors, um, contractors, I know, pay their employees near prevailing rates. So if they're a union shop, they're getting paid about that rate to begin with because union rates are very competitive and close to the prevailing rate. If it's a plumber, an electrician, you know, somebody that's a skilled trade, um, my sense is they're over that 15, although we haven't asked them to certify anything. We know what rate we're paying, you know, the, the home office for hourly rates. Um, but I, but I don't know for some of the smaller contracts or even some of the self, um, self-employed type folks, how much they're getting paid. And, and I think Dave hit it on the head too, with his illustration about the uniform contractor. So part of it is going to be dependent on where the board, you know, chooses to set the boundary for this new regulation. If it's adopted, meaning if we're talking about, you know, administrative work or somebody in logistics and, and you know, the, or supply, you know, they may be below that $15 rate, but if you're kind of limiting it to those skilled or technical contracts or skilled labor positions, then you're probably not going to see it as much. But something that we would likely spend a little more time on if the board uh, wants to move forward from here and, you know, be able to give you a better answer with a draft ordinance. Steve, I just had one more thing. Uh, um, I did want to share that I had an email from a resident just expressing some concerns about this. And the couple of things um, that they mentioned were a concern about hurting the smaller businesses that might be um, sending in bids for these kinds of uh, size projects, um, possibly adding to a business unfriendly reputation that Ferguson Township might have. Um, those were some concerns that were, were expressed. And then I guess I was wondering, just from your perspective, what, what would be the, um, the oversight um, 
the enforcement? I mean, what kind of, who is doing that? And um, is there something similar that you do with these larger prevailing wage contracts or is that all done through separate means that you don't have to currently do? So, so currently with the prevailing rate contracts, the requirement for the contractor to submit certified payrolls. So they actually submit notarized forms that have the employee's name, uh, social security is maybe redacted, um, some of the personal information, and then they'll have the number of hours every day that they worked, and they'll have the amount that they're paid. And with all the prevailing rate contracts, there's a base and a fringe. So think of fringe as your perks, so to speak, your benefits, and then the base is their base hourly rate. So they submit those that they're certified. We are supposed to do spot checks on those routinely, but for the most part, on a typical contract, the certifications are submitted. We make sure they're submitted um, prior to making payment to the contractor and they go in the file and much that's the end of it, unless you know, a Freedom of Information Act or somebody you know, wants to see them and then they're available upon request. They, they're also subject to audit by the Department of Labor. I don't believe we typically get audited, but they could be to make sure that the township is maintaining proper records and in compliance. Okay, so you would just be reviewing those in the same way. It wouldn't be any new hurdle. Uh, I would sure, hope it would right. be, a, I would hope it would, if we put it in as a contract requirement, that um, my hope is that they would then be able to submit a certification and that's the end of it. But if we needed to, we can spot check employees. I don't know what the, well, with prevailing rate, Department of Labor, is the oversight. So with something like this, it would just be us. Yeah, that, that's the question I was going to ask is, do we have any legal ability to then look at someone's records to make sure they're actually complying? Well, I think, um, you know, legal review would be part of this process. I, I haven't explored, you know, where our limitations are as a municipality, but um, you know, you are free to, to set your own procurement guidelines. So there's at least, you know, your, your authority to, um, you know, establish these regulations. But prior to doing so, I would think that'd be an answer we'd want to be pretty certain about that, um, you know, that we had the teeth to require those as part of the submittal of a bid for a project. And then I guess just, you know, back to the point Steve made about knowing what the difference here is, I think it'd be important to know what the difference is made here if this is adopted to know what kind of change was um, was affected. So to know that people are getting, weren't getting paid, you know, this um, living wage before and they are now, I think that would be valuable moving forward. All right. Thank you. Um, so can you still hear me right now? We can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. That's great. Um, what, what do you think, is there going to be a financial impact to us? So I don't, my assessment is no, but perhaps, what do you, what do you guys think about that? I, I agree with that assessment. <laughs> Guys, I think there's potential that there could be. I mean, you have to think about, um, you know, how additional contract requirements or bid requirements would impact a vendor's bid. So are they going to, in the interest of you know, complying with the requirements, increase their bid amount or their base bid amount or quote provided in this case? Um, you know, to, to compensate or to adjust for any increased wages they may have to pay. So, I mean, it's difficult to put a number around, but I think I'd have to say there, there likely would be an impact on some of our projects, particularly as Dave said earlier, which I didn't even, you know, allude to in the narrative, the, the jobs that are above the prevailing wage threshold, but class, are classified as maintenance and therefore not uh, obligated to meet those standards. So microsurfacing is a prime, prime example of that where you're talking, you know, six figure plus contract that that wage uh, is not, you know, a factor of. So that 
you know, that could uh, have an effect on, on how those bids come in, but it's difficult to predict how much. Right. I, I have a sense from our, some of our contractors, what, you know, what their employees are getting paid, especially if they're union shops. But as Dave mentioned, microsurfacing is a big one and line striping is the other big one. Those are not, those do not require certified payroll. So we don't know what the hourly rates are. And they typically come here from out of town. Right. Yeah, I've, I, I know the operations that you're talking about. Any other questions or? Steve, this is, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out where where somebody can make a comment who's not a part of the board, if this is appropriate. Right <laughs> you know, I, I think all of this discussion is very helpful. In fact, uh, almost all of those items are items that, that I thought of when, when I uh, saw the item on the agenda. A couple of things that, that are of concern to me, frequently, with with contracts under twenty five thousand dollars, for example, we're dealing with small operations, small companies. We're not dealing with the imps, and we're not dealing with the hawbakers. Uh, imps and hawbakers have a whole cadre of employees who handle their bookkeeping issues. These small companies, uh, you know, may have one person who does bookkeeping part time, uh, along with other tasks. I, I think about the fact that with a small company, an employee with a contract or a vendor with a contract with the township under $25,000 may have an employee who is not only working on the township job, but also working on two or three other jobs. And so the ability for the employer to pay the township prevailing weight for two hours a day and another rate uh, for six hours a day and the complications with regard to bookkeeping uh, I just I just are, are we creating an environment in which some of our local vendors we use on a regular basis might find this to be onerous I think the other the other question is, once we get a draft of, of a draft, not, not the past thing, but a draft, that we run it by two or three of our regular vendors that we typically use for contracts under $25,000 to get an idea of their feedback with regard to how this would work or impact with their particular company and, and uh, their bidding process. Uh, because I think, I certainly don't want, I, I want township money to be paid for services uh, in the township from local business wherever possible. I wanna turn that money over locally if at all possible. And, and if that's my goal, in terms of having contracts, I want to make sure that our local companies can handle whatever we're asking them to do uh, uh, in order to comply with this particular uh, uh, change. Okay, thank you, Bill. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, anything else on comments or? So I'll um, add a few things. So I, I think with any. Um, legislation, any ordinance that we pass, there is a cost and there is a benefit. So I would be very reluctant to give a veto power to companies who will always say uh, that they would want to do whatever is uh, the cheapest option for them. And what we need to weigh is the benefits that this will bring along with the cost. I, I mean, I want full consultation with the local businesses. I'm not saying we should not do that but that should not be the only means that, oh, this is going to, you know, uh, this is going to put burden on our companies, we'll get a bad reputation. Well, 
do we want to get a reputation that we are a place where companies exploit our laborers? Um, so there is, there is a balance there and we need to make sure uh, that we do this right uh, and not just tilt it over to whatever the companies say, we'll just do it. Um, I guess my, my thought on it uh, at this point is I'm not in favor of moving forward with writing an ordinance. I, I, I'm not convinced that we get a, a benefit that would affect enough people that it would be worth the, the cost, both the township and the businesses to comply. Uh, I would be, you know, if, if we could uh, get more information about whether companies are already paying at that rate in general. Uh, I don't know if we went, even want to do that, but um, or if I, I don't want to do that, but uh, for myself, I don't see uh, supporting writing an ordinance at this point, but it'll be up to the board to decide what, you know, the majority wants to do, so. Yeah, and, and one of the options could be, so, so one of the things is, uh, yeah, I, I would also like this to be based on the data and, you know, what are the costs and what are the benefits? And one of the issues is that we don't possibly have the data or a means to have the data. So one option could be to have something, uh, uh, something for like, um, I, I don't know, six months or a year to see how it goes, then we will have the data uh, with a sunset clause and then decide whether to make this permanent or not. Steve, can I just ask a question? I think uh, yeah, Lisa. I'm thinking along the same lines as Steve is, and also you, Prasenjit, because I do want to know what those numbers are. So I'm wondering if there were, if, um, you know, I would wonder if there would be an option to do it the other way to start collecting this data now um, and see where these companies are at in terms of what they're paying before we enact the um, the ordinance to see what it would do, where we're at right now, and maybe there is a better way to craft it once we know what the actual situation is. I, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for uh, collecting the data and then um, making a decision based on that, yeah. So I guess I would have a question based on those that, those comments uh, for either Dave Walker, Dave Modrecker, would it be something we could do with, as we get in bids for these, just ask companies if they would voluntarily answer the question of do they, are their employees paid $15 an hour? Would it affect their, their interest in bidding on a contract? Maybe, you know, just collect data for a while before we consider a requirement and find out if if there really is something that we need to require um i, I think we could do that i'm I, i'm a little bit um confused about where exactly we'd be focusing you know our our energy i mean are we speak, are we strictly talking about um you know skilled labor contracts or contracts that the township is awarding um that fall below the prevailing wage threshold or that don't fall under the guidance of prevailing wage? Is this something that, you know, as Dave illustrated before, may apply to, you know, clerical staff or administrative support? I mean, I, we, can, we can give you, we can do our best and we can give you the data that we're able to ascertain. Of course, you know, folks are, would be under no obligation to share with us what they're paying their, uh, their employees. And, you know, maybe presumably some of that data is available you know, either through the Department of Labor or through another source, you know, maybe that we could do a, a deeper dive into as well. But I'm, I'm not sure that without clear direction, we'd be getting you the information you're looking for. Okay. Yeah, so I think from my perspective, the, uh, if we are talking about the more skilled the labor is, they possibly are already making that. So if, it, you know, I would not be in favor of doing this only for skilled labor. So this would be sort of a, you know, more for all labor. This is a sort of a minimum uh, wage that you would have to pay for 
for all, but that's just, you know, of course, I, I'm, I have one opinion among five in the board. So whatever the rest of the board wants, if we want to go that way. And another option could be if we go back to people who have submitted bids uh, and done projects with us uh, in the last year or two, um, who, in, who fall in that category. That is, they are above uh, $10,000 uh, bids and not uh, one that the state requires a pre prevailing wage. Uh, and we tell them that, hey, the, uh, the township is considering this ordinance or something in this area. How will this affect you? Or let us know if you're already paying that or how many you're not paying. Uh, they might be willing to at least comment on this and say, hey, this is what the issue is, or we might get some comments from actually uh, companies who we have done business with and might have a vested interest in uh, putting their comments with respect to this uh, potential ordinance. Yeah, I, I would have a question for you, Prasenjit. Um, are you thinking in terms of every employee in the company or just the employees who are working on our project? I was thinking of employees who are uh, working on our project. Okay. So, you know. Okay. Now we, yeah. And I guess that's Dave's question is how, how we define that. You know, what level are, is someone working on our project? But, you know, yeah. Yeah, I guess it would that. involve. Yeah. yeah well, and that, that could be, yeah. That, yeah. It, it, in, in my eyes, that would involve anyone who is doing bookkeeping and whatever else is required for this and, and administrative uh, work. Uh, yeah, and the, the, the issue is that there, there could be, uh, like um, Mr. Keo said, there could be somebody working two hours and uh, you know we could have a minimum hour there that if, if someone works on this particular thing for more than these many hours, then yeah. Mm, so hey, those are all you. design questions. Yeah, go ahead. I, I get the part about labor. Are you thinking it applies to people that we buy supplies from? So if we're, if we're doing business with somebody and we buy ten, fifteen thousand dollars worth of stuff from them, but it's not a labor on our contract. I was not thinking of you know buying. Not thinking of vendors, right? Yeah. It's more like construction type contracts. I think is what. Yeah, the labor. As in, so in, in my eyes, I, you know, it's, it's uh, and it is for the projects uh, that we are getting done for the Ferguson Township per se. So, because that's sort of a little bit more of a moral responsibility for that than um, what, um, you know, other they're doing outside. Steve, this is Bill Keogh again. Hey, Bill. Uh, I guess the other question that I would have as we talk about this is how would we handle contracts with Penn State? They do a number of things for us during a given year uh, using grad students, using uh, you know, uh, 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 a variety of their resources. Um, and while I, I have no answer for that, I, I think has to be worked into the formula somehow as to whether uh, Penn State contracts are exempt or if they're not exempt, um, what standards do we apply uh, for those contracts uh, when we have them? Just something to think about. Yeah, I guess my question of that be for Dave, for Volca, do we have any contracts of the size that we're talking about with Penn State? Or have we had any? The only ones I can think of were street tree inventories, and we don't have that contract with them anymore. Yeah, we, we've we've um, partnered with the Sustainability Institute and other arms of the university to you know either do design or analysis or some you know level of work for us that would we were we would get a mutual benefit you know they would have a class or, or a group of students that would work on something and uh, we would get some kind of work product out of it typically those aren't done um, through a bidding process I mean, we don't we don't get those we might find an opportunity as it presents itself but um, if there were a contract where penn state would be a, 
a bidder or would be submitting a quote other than what Dave mentioned, maybe, you know, in years past where we've worked with them to do uh, tree inventories, uh, nothing's, nothing's coming to mind right now. Okay. Give it some more thought. Yeah. So I guess the question is, where do we want to go at this point as a board? Does anybody want to make a motion or suggest more information? Laura. Conceptually, I'm not opposed to something like this, but I'm, um, it seems like it's very complex. And I think, um, I'm not sure about the data collection per se, but perhaps narrowing the focus. I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Um, but it seems, it seems rather complex for us to try to implement. And I'm wondering if staff feels that way or not, not really. I, I better having had the discussion and narrowing things down. I, I was really concerned if it reached out to all our vendors. Okay. Um, a, a lot of these guys, HVAC, electric, tree planting, the micro, the line striping, tree trimming. I, I'm just making a, a list. You know, if, if the board or Dave asked me to reach out to them with some kind of questionnaire, I can gather some information. I, I'd rather do it outside of the bidding environment because I don't know if that's the appropriate way to, to just get questions answered. Right. I was also thinking of some kind of survey, like I'm talking about a survey for COVID impact and Bill mentioned localization and I'm definitely a fan of that, but I, I don't want to broaden something so much. Um, so do you the think- The only thing I would- Oh, I yeah. um, the, the only thing I'd add to what Dave said, if you're if you're looking for staff's opinion at this juncture, which is you know kind of early because I think we're still talking about what the framework might be and what this regulation might look like, is if you're you know referring strictly to you know an enforcement side, which is you know meaning how much administrative burden might something like this add, and describe what we'd be looking at. It would be you know in, incorporated into our process and. We would include some kind of mechanism for a, a the successful contractor or vendor to submit uh, certified payrolls or pay stubs or some kind of verification that they indeed uh, were paying the, the minimum of fifteen dollars an hour as they um, committed to do in, in their bid. But if you're talking about some of the broader questions about impacts to township projects, whether this might you know drive pricing up or have other you know sort of um, reverberations on local economies, whether we would be forced to, you know, go outside the center region because there were no local contractors that could do the job sustaining those wages. I, I don't have an answer for that. That's going to take a little deeper dive. Well, that I was wondering about that. And I was also wondering about uh, like the com the companies that come in for the microsurfacing and that kind of thing. Um, I, I doubt they're paying that much. And I don't, I don't even know if there is a company that, I don't even know if there is a company that does that kind of work that would pay that much. So I would be, I guess, interested in finding out those things, um, but maybe not really directing staff to write an amendment yet. Yeah, I mean, I would be interested in, um in in finding out uh, uh like uh, i think dave madrecker said from people but again um i think philosophically i do not think that we should just do what companies want us to do and uh i do not think that whether you know if 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 the um if we put a fifteen dollars an hour they're not paying that let's say the microsurfacing people um, in, in the, I, I think in the history that I read before any minimum wage type thing, nobody wanted to pay that. Only because of the uh, regulation did people start paying that. Yes, that would in turn mean our costs would go up. But um, right. So I, so I think I agree with you, and that is that is true. I'll draw from experience in the local food system. When you work in the local food system, you're working in a system that um, 
extracts value all along the system. And so if you're buying food in a grocery store, um, there are not living wages paid to a lot of people that are putting that food into that grocery store. So if you try to work in the local food system and you try to pay farmers a living wage for what they're producing um, and processors, uh, you know, adequate amount, you typically find that there's a need to subsidize that. Um, and so what I'm concerned about, it's not really so much the idea that we would be pushing on the system, but it's more that the actual practical result of that might be that the system isn't ready to absorb that yet. And that's, I guess, why I'm asking about like the microsurfacing companies. Um, it's one thing if there's just a few of them that pay that, but if there's actually none of them that pay that, then we won't be able to get that work done. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to try to push a little bit, but not if it jams us up. And I don't know how to determine that. Yeah, but I think the difference here is um, <clears throat> between the grocery store example and this is that in the grocery store, I'm going in and I am saying that, okay, for milk, I'm not going to pay $10 a gallon. Uh, and so there is a thing there. In this case, um, what I'm not saying is that uh, we, this is not a universal minimum wage. So the micro surfacer does not have to really pay $15 an hour to everyone they employ for every project. But for projects that they are doing for the uh, township, those projects, they would have to pay 15 an hour. Nice. And yes, that would mean that then they put their markup and we would pay a little bit more. I see. But given our $32 million budget and with all sorts of money that we are spending, my guess is that that additional markup that uh, would be there will not make us uh, not be able to sustain that. And yeah, if, if it is that is the concern that this is going to be too expensive for us that we cannot afford, um, then I would like to know that. And yeah, then I would not want that uh, to be done. I, I guess my concern is not that it would increase, that would be too expensive for us, but if if you make a decision to only shop at grocery stores to pay at least $15 an hour, you're going to be very hungry because you won't find one. And my question is, you know, I, I actually think that it's probably, there's a likelihood that people are paying $15 an hour and that's the data I would like to see. But if, if, the microsurfacing does pay, say, $10 an hour, and all the companies doing that pay their employees $10 an hour, we're not a big enough customer that we can influence necessarily what they do. So they may just say, well, we're not interested. And that's where I, where I go to the grocery store example. If, if no one's willing to do that to get our contract, then we have no one to do the work. But no, I don't no, think that's... Yeah. yeah. Again, the grocery store is not a fair example because. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but <laughs> even if you take microsurfaces, if there's five companies doing microsurfacing that might bid, and none of them pays that much, and none of them is willing to do the paperwork to have two different pay systems, so they don't bother to bid, we don't have anyone to do the microsurfacing. Well, I think yeah, that's I the question then, isn't it? Paperwork issue, yeah. I don't think that we're really, any of us would be interested in just like saying, oh, the companies don't want to do it. We're not going to try to get them to do it. It's a little bit different than that. It's more doing a survey to see sort of what's out there in the market and see if it's a reasonable policy to float. And I, yeah. I'm definitely, I definitely be fine with doing that if we can think of a way that's uh, not too complicated uh, or part of a bidding process, like has been mentioned, but we definitely don't want to do that. Um, so if, you know, I'd be willing to, to do that, to move that forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the survey. I'm fine with making reasoned uh, decisions after finding out everything. Yeah. But right now we are all guessing about all yeah. that. All guessing, yeah. lots of guessing. So. So I guess the question for 
staff is, is this something, I mean, have we sort of come up with something that you think would, you could do to get some data for us that would be reasonable or? I mean, uh, Dave and I'll talk offline and we can compare notes and see if we got the, you know, the gist of it and, and can present something back to you, um, you know, in relatively short order that gives you some insight as far as, you know, how regulation like this may impact some of these contracts. So basically what you're saying is um, you guys would talk and then maybe at the next meeting you would say, we decided we could survey monkey 10 companies or something like that. Or are you saying you guys are going to talk and then get the data and then come back to us? I can talk to Dave or I can tell you right now what I think is the easiest way for me to do it, but I don't want to speak out of turn. Well, now it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just call the contractors we do work with and ask them the questions and take notes. Yeah, that would seem like the, the easy button is just use the relationships that we've built with the contractors that we've worked with over the years and just see what they'd be willing to share. I mean, that that's probably the, you know, the quick and dirty way to get something non-scientific. Uh, don't expect anything statistically significant, but we can give you something to, to chew on and, and maybe, you know, go from there. Yeah, I, I mean, I can reach out to a dozen people. I can tell you the range of the contract. I can tell you how much it value of that would be in a year. Do they pay 15? Don't they? Would they bid? If we change it and what's the impact in dollars? You're so awesome. Thanks. Dave has a lot of that information just floating around up there. <laughs> yeah, I already have it in a spreadsheet. I just got to type it out. <laughs> Steve, uh, this is so, Tokyo again. Yes, Bill. Uh, Dave and Dave, probably the one other thing because of, of the internet and everything else. I can't that we're the only municipal government having this kind of a discussion across the country. And in fact, I can't believe that there are some municipal governments somewhere in this country that have enacted something similar to this. And so in terms of your surveying, uh, my thought is that you reach out your hand through your contacts uh, nationally and see if there are some other programs, some other municipalities uh, at the municipal level, not the state level, but the municipal level or city level that that uh, are doing this kind of thing uh, already and see if we, you know, why reinvent the wheel if, if the wheel's already running. Sure, that's easy enough. Or alternatively, just turn it over to our labor relations department and have them do it. But <laughs> you're looking at the labor relations department. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't think we need a motion for this. Then I think this is something you guys will get back to us on when you have some something to report, and we'll continue the discussion at that point. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Then that's where we'll leave this one at this point, and. Move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the award of contract 2018-C26, traffic signal phasing changes. Dave M. The bids were opened publicly for contract 2018-C26, traffic signal phasing changes on June 9th for a number of uh, bidders, or one bidder in attendance. The bid was advertised in the Center Daily Times. Invitations were sent out to a number 11 uh, qualified bidders. We received uh, two bids, MMB Services LLC, $29,961.32. Telpower Inc, $34,534.50. In particular, this changes the signal operations phasing of three different intersections, Blue Course, and Martin, Science Park, Pine Hall, Science Park, Old Gatesburg on certain approaches. And this also involves something called a uh, flashing yellow arrow. So if you'd like, uh, maybe we could do the recommendation, the motion, and then decide if you wanna watch a video or learn more about the flashing yellow arrow. 
I recommend the Board of Supervisors award this contract to MMB Services in the amount of $29,961.32. And I do have the video loaded up here. If the board okay. did, it might be a good, uh, it's a minute and 23 long, so it's pretty short. Okay, why don't we go do the video and then we'll take a motion at that point. Okay. If we, if we decide we want to do it after seeing the video. Okay, that yeah, might change your mind, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to share my screen here. Nobody heard that? Really? Oh, wow. It's all about. I'm sorry. It was really loud in my ears. <laughs> oh, I would have uh, I would have narrated for you. Ooh. Well, it had the subtitles so we could read it. So. <laughs> oh, I apologize for that. I wonder why that was. Eh? Flashing yellow hours are, are new to Pennsylvania. It'll be our first one in the region. It is the new standard and it means you can turn on yellow, proceed with caution. Okay. Chief has anything he wants to add to that from a motor vehicle side, but we would do a little bit of education and outreach, put up message boards, you know, put a little something on our website, um, get the word out the way we get the word out these days with our community coordinator. Nothing for me. You got it, Dave. Education. Okay. So do we have a motion? I, Laura, move that the Board of Supervisors award contract 2018-C26 traffic signal phasing changes to MNB Services, LLC, in accordance with their bid in the amount of $29,961.32. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Laura, second by Patty. Uh, does anyone have any further discussion or questions? Yeah, I just wanted to so find you. out. Yeah. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm thinking of this as where basically where we have a uh, left turn um, yield where on green right now, that's where we'll have these uh, flashing yellow arrows instead. And so now it'll be, um, it'll go from uh, green to yellow to red. Um, and um, so it, it, this was, um, I don't recall uh, discussing about this. This was done in a, like prior to my uh, joining the board or was there a need for this or are we uh, experimenting? So I just wanted a little bit of context. Sure. These are um, traffic signal optimization and safety improvements. Oftentimes they come to us through um, motorist and resident complaints. And in this case, these have kind of piled up for a couple of years. And um, our township engineer was able to more or less bundle these three intersections together, revise the signal drawings. Um, and, and put it out to bid. 
So there probably has not been a lot of discussion as of recent. You can see it's a 2018 contract. So it's been on our books for some time. Um, yeah, maybe before, you know, your, your tenure. Um, funds that at one point in time were, you know, budgeted. It's out of the transportation improvement fund. At the most notably the intersection of Blue Course and Martin had, you know, a number of complaints. Sometimes the left turn is permissive. Sometimes it's uh, prohibited or a combination of those two so that you make that left turn movement when it's safe based on gaps in traffic or sight distance. And so this is upgrading the left turns at three legs of three different intersections. It's just that now we're using this flashing yellow arrow because it's now the type of installation equipment that's approved for that type of a movement. That might have been a long-winded answer. I've been doing that a lot tonight, apparently. No, no, I, that, that's great. And I mean, it's, it's going to uh, help um, with the situation in those three intersections. And I'm fine with that. I just wanted uh, that context. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? In that case, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, next item is a discussion of future Board of Supervisors meeting format. Uh, thank you. So since April 6th, the board, as well as other township authorities, boards and commissions has been meeting virtually uh, in our Zoom environment to conduct business. Uh, given that Center County is effectively in the green phase of Governor Wolf's plan to reopen Pennsylvania, uh, we are permitted to resume gathering uh, in person at the township main meeting room, should the board desire, as long as we can provide some additional safety protocol, uh, limiting the number of individuals that are allowed in the building, ensuring appropriate social distancing, providing for personal protective equipment, et cetera. Um, board members are still permitted to meet virtually if you choose to do so, or we can do some kind of um, you know a hybrid model where we have the virtual room open and, and others that want to come to the main meeting room and meet in person, I uh, would be able to do that. Uh, but thought it'd be a good opportunity for the board to discuss uh, July's meetings and, and what format you wish to have them. Thanks, Dave. Uh, does anyone have a strong feeling one way or the other, whether we should be starting back in person or continue going this way or? I'm not seeing any strong opinions. How about weak opinions? <laughs> yeah, so um, I had mentioned about, I, I do have asthma, and so that was uh, uh, concerned. But I, I did uh, read up and so on, and the risks seem, if we have social distancing, I'll have a mask and so on. So that they, and, and at some point, you have to go out. So the risks would be minimal for my case. So I don't need any um, extra consideration for my health conditions. I would be fine either way. And um, I'm fine attending in person too. So I just wanted to make that clarification because I had uh, expressed some concerns before, but I'm fine now. Okay. Anyone else? Laura. Uh, so the only question I have is I, well, I attended virtually via phone, I guess, the college township meeting recently, and they don't have the capacity to stream CNET like we do have. Um, so I was just reliant on the phone. Uh, they are meeting in person, and so they're all masked. And I had some, at some points in time with some individuals who are talking, I had some significant issues understanding what they were saying through the masks through the phone. So, um, you know, that's, that's my only concern that it will be hard to understand what we're saying. So not really having a solution for that, but yeah. just, uh, you know, 
It's a thing. Bill? Uh, <clears throat> being that I'm an old person and I'm a, also a people person, I just do not like this whole meeting format at all. Uh, I am contending with it, not only for you guys, but for the planning commission, uh, for the park and recreation board, for the Ferguson Township Park and Recreation Board. So I'm going to these meetings, but I personally do not care for this format at all. Uh, if we practice six foot social distancing, uh, I see no reason why we, we shouldn't go back to uh, at least having a hybrid where both are available uh, or go back to regular meetings. But that's my personal opinion. I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable in this format at all. That brings up a point, Bill. I didn't realize I should make this point, um, right. Uh, I strongly believe that we should have all opportunities for individuals to be able to participate in our meeting without having to come to the building, even if we're there. So I'm sure Bill won't be <laughs> using it, but um, I want to make sure that we definitely do all the things that we need to do for those that don't feel comfortable coming to us. If I could and just that's, why, that's why I that. said that I, I'm okay with a, I'm okay with a, uh, uh, a hybrid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's throw both. it to Dave because I think he's thought about that. So. Yeah. Just, just make one comment. I think is, I think it's doable, but I had a conversation with Cindy Hahn, uh, the birthday girl we heard from her earlier uh, about this. And there's a challenge, a technical challenge on, you know, with CNET for the hybrid models. Patton Township's done this uh, where they've had a few of their elected officials there. And then they also open up a Zoom environment with CNET physically present so that they can record, you know, those that are in attendance. Uh, I think we have a solution worked out, but we haven't um, tested it yet. So uh, if the preference is to move to, uh, you know, a meeting format that allows for both virtual attendance as well as in-person attendance, I would just, you know, kind of make sure that we can uh, accommodate that using our technology, particularly for the board meetings and the planning commission meetings, because those are things that are uh, recorded by CNET. So uh, the other meetings may not be as big of an issue. And would, would we be able to set up the phone in line if, if we were all meeting in person, but someone wanted to make a comment or listen to our meeting and make a comment, uh, we could set up the phone line so that they could do that. Yeah, the phone, the phone is an easy solution that we can tie right into the PA system so it can be picked up by CNET. I think we can do that with Zoom as well. Um, we, have a, we have an adapter here that can turn a microphone jack into a port that plugs into uh, to a laptop. So if that functions as it's supposed to, we should be able to tie the feed, the audio feed anyway right into CNET uh, through the PA, and then they can um, be present on the uh, recording of the webinar for their for their broadcast. Okay. Bill Keogh again, just a, a, a question. Are, is the board going to make whatever decision they make for all of our ABCs? In other words, planning commission, parks, trees, uh, or are each of those boards going to make their own decision? That's a good question. Ask a question. <laughs> I, I really think really they should be able to, I mean, as long as they have a remote way of being able to, I, I strongly support individuals right to choose their own exposure. So I don't wanna make a decision for other people in terms of that. Tonight, the Trade Commission um, plans to meet July remote and August remote. Yeah, I, I think letting each, I mean, as long as we're still able to do it under the, the right to know regulations, I think if we let each, uh, 
each group decide what works best for them, particularly like the tree commission normally meets in a small room. So I think that, Lisa. Um, I think, uh, well, just to talk about the ABCs for a second first, um, I just wouldn't want anyone to feel forced to come back and meet in a small room if, um, you know, if the decision was made that they should be meeting in person again. So as long as that option was there for someone who didn't feel comfortable to still call in and be a part of that conversation if they couldn't zoom in. Um, I just, I wouldn't want anyone to feel like they had to choose um, to come in if they didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, and and then, it should be easy for anything that isn't CNET. Yeah. To be exactly. easy to set up a remote. Because I right. think CNET's the bigger problem as far as our meetings and planning commission, so. And right, and with our meetings and planning commission, I think um, if we were to go back in person, I think that would be my my main concern because I think we can keep the the numbers in the room down and we have a large enough room uh, that we could separate ourselves. But again, I wouldn't want members of the public to feel like they had to come in right. and be present in order to participate. So as long as we can, um, you know, Dave and Cindy can figure that out. Um, you know, so that no one is forced to come in. That's my concern there. You know, I'm, I'm fine either way. I think this is, um, I think this is working fine, despite the fact that I did get dropped off the call earlier. So my feelings might have changed um, an hour ago if we had had this discussion. So now that I'm back in um, <laughs> with a strong signal, uh, I, I don't know. I think, I think it's good. I think it's, um, you know, if anyone's going to go back, I think it'd be nice to have the board back, but I am supportive of meeting in this environment too, because it's safe. It keeps everyone separate. So, and I um, agree. I think there might be some, um, some audio concerns with the masks, but I'm sure we can overcome that if we're, if we were going to meet in person. So I guess either way is fine with me. Yeah, I'm also fine with either way. Yeah, and, and the I, I would I think the hybrid would give me flexibility because my assistant told me that I should uh, at work uh, told me that I should possibly um, uh, stay away from uh, coming to office uh, uh, because um, I might get beaten up because I sneeze a lot and <laughs> cough and <people laughs> <are. laughs> when I have allergies. So some of those days. In general, I might be going in person because I also like to, you know, see people. Um, but uh, some of those days uh, when I have these allergies, it might, and you don't know what it is actually. So uh, it might be better so that I don't get beaten up at the township to log in via Zoom instead of uh, <laughs> scaring people in person. Well, we promise to only, only. Uh do verbal abuse, no physical abuse. <laughs> right. No, those days are over. <laughs> sure. Um, so I guess the question will be, do we have a, do we want to do another meeting like this and then ease back in mid-July or jump back into it at the beginning of July? If we're going to do it, we might as well do it if Dave can work out the whatever details. I yeah, kind I'm, of think I'm fine with the meeting in person again. I think we might have to go back remote in the fall. So I, yeah. if we can get a couple of live meetings and now. Yeah, yeah so I think that's a very real possibility later. And we need to watch that in even between now and the next meeting, which will be three weeks. Yeah. So if there is a change in status, we may have to change our plans. So we, we have to, we can bring our own snacks and drinks, right? <laughs> Yes. Non-alcoholic drinks and snacks are prohibited, are permitted. <laughs> still didn't change that rule, huh? Okay, fine. We still did not change that rule, right? <laughs> okay. That's the difference so, then, isn't it? <laughs> so at this point, we'll figure on a in-person meeting with remote options for the next meeting, which is July 6th. Is that right? Yep. July 6th, correct. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll play it by ear from there if things change in terms of the state requirements and all. So, okay. Um, 
The next item is staff and committee reports. So we have the ad hoc facilities committee. Okay. Um, wasn't nothing earth shattering was discussed really. We just talked about um, the park maintenance facility. Um, their lease is up in November and they're just exploring options of where to go, what to do. Um, then let's see. Then we, we talked about the COG building parking lot and um, just discussed different ways of trying to extend the life of that parking lot, which it's almost at the end of its life, apparently. Um, and I think it was sort of decided that seal coating isn't going to do it. The ruts and the um, drainage ditches, etc., are pretty severe. So um, then they, Millbrook Marsh, they've had a hard time getting their initial draft of an RFP together just because of rolling furloughs. And um, the staining project at the Spring Creek Educational Building is done and came in under budget. And that is about it. Thank you. Any questions for Patty? Okay, next is Public Services Environmental Committee. Okay, so yeah, we had a meeting uh, and um, uh, I think Dave was, uh, Pibulka was there too. And um, so it, it was on Zoom um, and the, the main things that were discussed were uh, sort of the uh, items number four and five in the uh, attachment and I'll summarize um, what uh, they talked about. Um, so I think in item number four, there was this uh, pump station where uh, there has been increased sort of wastewater flow and infiltration uh, to the point where they had to bring in trucks and uh, sort of carry out the wastewater and, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so um, they um, uh, said that there was a study done that was that evaluated the options uh, that were, um, you know, that that, um, that that were presented. That you know, how do we resolve that, and, and so on. So I, I must say that I did not, I don't really understand uh, the um, <clears throat> the details of this. Maybe I should go there and uh, see it. But the, essentially, what they said is they would do an upgrade to the pump station. And that would increase the wastewater flows, and uh, then um, things um, things would be fine. Um, so this is what um, my impression of uh, that discussion was. Uh, and um, then uh, we talked about something called again, which was new to me, something called nutrient capacity by the UAJA, and uh, this comes from uh, sort of the uh, the bigger picture is that uh, the Chesapeake Bay, um, Maryland sued Pennsylvania, and we need to keep under certain limits of what we are dumping into the water. And um, one of the things that um, uh, supposedly, um, and one of the things that uh, we are dumping into the water, which we don't have too much of a leeway on, is nitrogen. And um, the discussion said that um, there is some uh, area which is trying to uh, see if they can, I think it's a new development, which is trying to see if they can uh, release their water into the UAJA sewer service system. And so then the idea is that we are already at the limits of uh, what this uh, nitrogen, uh, in the amount of nitrogen that we can release into the water. Now, uh, and that there are so, there are some other discussions where uh, th that limit can be two different numbers, but uh, because uh, Maryland has sued Pennsylvania and we are already in non-compliance with respect to certain things, that number is unlikely to be going up. And um, so we are already at the limit. So now the question is when this, uh, uh, if, if we allow these um, customers or developers in the area 
uh, to connect to the UAJS your service system, then uh, we might have to pay or implement certain things to, um, to reduce the nitrogen in the water to the um, levels where uh, we need to keep it uh, or in general, um, uh, more of the nutrient capacity that we are dumping in. And for that, uh, how do we charge these people? And at some point, um, it was discussed is that it's 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 better for uh, for them to go away to um, to Spring Banner Walker um, Authority or um, no so there's, sorry the a neighboring authority which is maybe Belfont area or some other um, a water um, authority but they don't it, it's not um, economically it's much easier for them to connect to ours because we are our system is closer or whatever the system is so there was some. Um, discussion as to how they will pay for it and uh, what do we do um, and and that sort of uh, to be the discussion is to be continued. Um, we uh, also had a, a brief presentation and discussion by Pam Adams on the draft climate uh, action resolution uh, and um, on the lines of uh, what we have had her uh, present to us. Uh, and, um, you know, there were discussions about whether it should be 2050 or 2030 and what are the numbers and uh, so on and so forth, but nothing, um, nothing substantial or at least that, that sort of got, uh, caught my eye. And then um, I think it was forwarded to the general forum for adoption. Um, then they uh, unveil the logo uh, for this uh, uh, for the sustainable um, center region logo, um, and uh, that was some Penn State students who had worked with um, uh, Pam, and that sort of looks like a tree which you know, that looks like a light bulb and so on and so forth. So that um, people said that that was an interesting design and that would be adopted. Uh, and then a letter of support um, for CPACE and, and, and so on. So, um, so these were the items that were, uh, we primarily um, spent our um, time on. And if uh, Dave Pribulka has some important things that I missed, which I didn't understand in the nutrient discussion or the pump water discussion, please add, yeah. Okay, any questions for Prasenjit? Laura. Thank you. Thanks, Prasenjit. What is the logo for? Oh, this is uh, this is uh, the logo is for the sustainability efforts to the extent I understood. Uh, so this is going to be a sustainable center region logo. Um, for is, for like businesses that are green. For like for what? Oh no no. What? Well, I didn't. I don't think it's going to go to the businesses, but it's 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 far to be used in websites and uh, for under the cog uh, for the sustainability projects. Uh, I don't okay. Well, uh, maybe I didn't understand it correctly. No, that, that's no, correct. I don't think you might Fred understand it correctly. Reach. I just don't understand. Like, it's going to be like beside an entry on the website that's a sustainable thing yeah yeah let me see if i can bring up the website um oh you don't have to do that right now thank you i can look into that uh yeah i just it's not the cog logo it's not the park and rec logo no, but no, it's no. Just like a logo yeah so they have a website called sustainable center region Oh. And it will be put up there and uh, in okay. every other document they come up with, they're going to put that logo. So this then, I guess my question, question would be, would something like this be able to be broadened like and encompass that idea of like green building design and get some sort of like a um, code involvement with, yeah, they've gone above and beyond and now they get the stamp of approval of green design. Like, can we broaden this to actually have meaning like that, do you think? Yeah, so they talked about, um, they talked about sort of uh, putting this on projects and biking initiatives and 
uh, recycling educational pamphlets and so on. So it's, it's going to be used in a whole bunch of things and um, they, they do want to use it as widely uh, as people want to use it without forcing anyone. So thanks. You know, Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. it yeah. has, I think if you, if you, uh, I'll, I'll get the um, uh, logo offline and forward it to everyone, but they were, they were, it requires some interpretation, but there were parts that were uh, showing, okay, this part is uh, related to energy efficiency. This is renewable energy and this is transportation and water and land use. And so they tried to incorporate everything in that logo in symbolic form. Um, which I didn't get until it was explained, but <laughs> I'll forward it to everyone. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, any, any other questions for Prasenjit? Okay, next is the Public Safety Committee. Thank you. We met Tuesday, June 9th via Zoom. Um, we once again talked about the HAZMAT program transfer. Um, and just to review a little bit, there's a one year quit notice on that. Uh, so if we wanted to get out of that agreement, we could give one year notice and quit it. Um, the, the, the $75 for the first year and the second year, or sorry, $75,000 for the first year and the second year um, that Penn State will be um, giving to the program should cover the costs of the third year. Um, the motion uh, that we voted on was to send that to the general forum via the, uh, the executive committee. And that motion um, passed for yes, one absent, one abstain, and one nay. So Terrace Township had written a letter just prior to the meeting um, that Steve Bear actually did respond to just prior to the meeting as well. Um, they had actually, I don't know, reiterated some of the questions that we had cleared up in advance. Um, so I'm not, I think all those questions were answered sufficiently. And also I wanna point out that in the meeting minutes that we approved this past meeting, there was a synopsis of the answers to some of those financial questions as well. So you can review that there if you'd like to. Um, but anyway, so Harris, I think it was just a timing issue and they, um, their rep voted no. I'm not really, didn't really understand it personally, but nonetheless, um, it's moving forward and Steve will see it tomorrow at executive committee tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, we also discussed again, the, the appeals board and the uh, the changes in that board um, and uh, uh, sorry the code board of appeals um, that is moving forward um, some some changes are there's not going to be any alternates anymore um, that meeting is going to be a regular meeting instead of a kind of like a as needed here and there meeting so they think they can get um, you know, more regular attendance and develop some camaraderie in that committee. They're going to utilize it for both just kind of um, uh, discussing issues and also then it will be the appeals board. Um, if it's, it's going to be advertised when it's working as the appeal board, it'll be advertised as needed. Um, and uh, see, they're going to meet monthly guidance, appeals, and um, seven members, three three-year terms are permitted, and then they, I guess, have to take a term off. Uh, we talked about COVID-19 safety monitoring at construction sites. Um, so I guess apparently there's there's some level of compliance and um, sometimes there isn't, sometimes there is. So we discussed, um, you know, what happens when there's not and code wants to ensure the safety of their workers. And so uh, they went through their process of, you know, 
they reschedule, they let the, the manager of the site know and they reschedule the inspection that needed to be done. And there is a fee for that to reschedule that um, because they're main, maintaining the you know, safety for their workers. Um, for me, that of course brought to mind, you know, that's actually where that's actually where that ends. So, you know, the state has set these standards in place at the local level. Companies are responsible for implementing them. The state doesn't really see whether they are or not implementing them, but sometimes our code officials do. They're not really necessarily in the position to enforce the state in that manner. Um, they're really just for their own worker safety enforcing it. So um, there, I guess there's like a little, seems like there's a little bit of a gap um, in enforcement of that. Um, I guess theoretically the police can be called. One employee can say, hey, my employer is not doing proper procedures. Um, we can all just guess what the likelihood of a random employee like reporting their employer is going to be. So that doesn't seem that effective. Nonetheless, that seems to be what's happening. Um, so hopefully businesses are complying and keeping their workers safe um, so we can stay in the green phase. Uh, some honest, you know, they're encountering some honest issues. You know, they're hot situations. Um, it's not easy to wear a mask all the time, but you know, I guess really they have to modify their operations to make sure those individuals stay hydrated and have enough breaks, um, that kind of thing. So talked for a while about that. Um, during staff updates. Uh, Um, Steve Baer talked about how the fire department is providing active support to the police officers during the demonstrations and um, marches that are occurring. So many thanks for that. Uh, they're also going to provide support um, for the fireworks that are going to be coming up in various locations around the center region. And Uh, in emergency management, uh, Sean reported that, um, as I believe Dave mentioned, the CARES funding that's going to be coming um, will be distributed through the county. Uh, so I guess we'll see if we get any of that. Uh, also mentioned the hazard mitigation plan that Let's see, each county in Pennsylvania is responsible for having a hazard mitigation plan and Pima via contract with Michael Baker Consulting does every county's hazard mitigation plan. And um, the, uh, Sean is gonna be working to identify hazards uh, with our manager. So Dave, that's you. Um, so, I'm not sure, I, I, I did wonder what we were gonna talk about with Sean in terms of hazards that we would want to get on this plan. Apparently, um, if something is listed on the plan, that opens up FEMA funding opportunities. Um, so some examples, uh, wildfire might be example of ha hazards that you would want on this as something that you might want to mitigate or have concern about. Um, so I guess I would be interested in learning a little bit more about that, Dave, um, and if we can contribute in any way that, to that, or Chief, if you have any thoughts on that. <clears throat> and then our committee, the Public Safety Committee, IDs the action items on that hazard mitigation plan then. One example of something we've done in the past regard in, in uh, respect to that is the vulnerable populations study that was done by an intern for Sean, really identifying populations that in an emergency might need uh, different communication methods, like maybe translation or something to this effect. Um, so that is one example of something that was done through that hazard mitigation plan. 
that's it. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Laura? Okay. Uh, next is Finance Committee. We met last uh, Thursday. Um, let's see the main items that we approved the application of a uh, payroll protection program loan for the library. Uh, general COG operations are not eligible for the payroll protection plan because they're government uh, functions, but because the library is actually a contract, the library uh, foundation contracts with COG to provide employees. So uh, that allows the library to apply for a PPP loan, which is forgivable. So that's the only local operation involving government that would be eligible because of the specific way it's set up under a contract. So that, that uh, they will be applying for that. It'll cover about two months of wages and then be forgivable. So essentially to be uh, several hundred thousand dollars that doesn't have to be paid back, which will help a lot in covering the, the time that we don't have, or the biggest thing is we don't know what we're gonna be getting from the state because uh, we do know that they're only gonna pay five twelfths of the, uh, normally they pay the full, full year allocation at the beginning of July. And this year they're paying five twelfths of it. So five months worth instead of 12 months worth and there's no real uh, decision been made whether the rest of it's gonna come or not. So we may be short on state funding this year. And this could do go a long ways to covering that if we are. So that was uh, approved by the finance committee. Uh, I'm not, I don't think it actually needs to go to the general forum for uh, further approval. I think that was one the finance committee could approve. Um, we are looking at refinancing the loan on the pools. Uh, we authorized Chris Gibbons to look into that uh, because Harris Township got such a great bank uh, rate on their loan for their public works building. Uh, the thought is we might be able to save a lot of money by renegotiating the loan for the pools because that's set to go up in a couple of years. So we're, we're uh, gonna have Chris Gibbons look at that if it does come back that there's a good opportunity, that would end up having to be a COG vote because since we'd be reborrowing, it would be a new loan entirely. It would require unanimous approval by the six municipalities. So that we may hear about later because I'm assuming we will be able to save money with it. So. Steve, you knew I was gonna ask that question. Oh yeah, I did. You know it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, the last one was a matter of changing the terms, but not redoing the loan. This would be redoing the loan into a completely different loan. So then it becomes a unanimous unit vote. So. Well, I'm glad somebody's clear, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so that's being looked at. Uh, we're, we're assuming we can save some money with that because the rates are so low right now. Um, the, uh, had a short discussion of the program plan and CIP. The program plan is gonna be abbreviated this year. We're not getting the full 250 page booklet. Although most of the information from last year can be applied to this year in terms of the, the overall program uh, view. So I'm, I intended and I forgot to uh, ask that they uh, provide that to members who came on this year and didn't get one last year that would get copies of last year's program plan so that everybody can uh, review that. Um, we did reviewed the interagency loan policy. Uh, that will be coming to the general forum eventually. It's basically just codifying when you can borrow from a fund or basically when you can borrow from the code fund because that's where we'd be borrowing from if we borrow something. So, because they're the one that has a large fund balance. Uh, and then Sean gave an update on FEMA reimbursement uh, he's putting together uh, a very large spreadsheet of what we're applying for reimbursement for. So and that was basically the finance committee meeting. Any questions or if not, we will move on to 
uh, the manager's report. Hey, Steve, I'm sorry. I have a question oh, about I Cog. Question. Thank, I, thanks. I have a question about Cog. Um, so I, I peeked, but I didn't really look at um, the executive committee agenda for tomorrow. Right. Is it is is what I thought I saw correct that we're extending the power of the executive committee again? Uh, we're discussing that tomorrow. We haven't okay. that that'll that's a decision that will come tomorrow. I uh, Eric was looking into ways that we can do a cog meeting. So if we can come up with a way, yeah. The the concern is trying to do a Zoom meeting with thirty two voting members and however staff and public. Yeah, you know, whether we can manage that, and Eric is looking into that. I think uh, if if we can, we'll probably you know uh, vote to uh, start having meetings next week. I don't think there's any way we can do an in-person meeting next week because all the places that you know anybody who has a place big enough for us to meet and keep distance doesn't want to use their meeting room for anything. I understand. Which basically is the school district. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. understand about uh, the in person. So, I, so if we if there is a reasonable way to hold a meeting, I think we'll vote to you know get back to full meeting. If there's not, then I think we'll go with uh, extending it for one more month. Okay. That um. Yeah. Right. So, the reality is though that if we're ever going to be green, it's going to be now and. Right. The fall is like mm, not, yeah. yeah well, really that, that's why we're looking for a way to do an online yeah. meeting. And try right. To so out I guess possible. my only thought on this is if it turns out that we decide we don't know how to do an online Zoom meeting, this meeting tomorrow, if we don't know how, right. that it's kind of time to reevaluate things because that means that forever until the end right. of the pandemic <laughs> we'll yeah. never be meeting according to our meeting right so. yeah and that that's gonna be our discussion tomorrow is now okay one. so <laughs> fabulous thanks yep. okay well, then we have uh manager's report uh there's the mpo uh technical Oh, it, normally that's just attached. Oh, okay. All right. The technical is just attached. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm Although, reading, Lisa, coordinating. Although, Lisa, have something on that? Oh, Lisa, had something on that. Yeah, I do. I just wanted to ask I have the CCMPO coordinating committee meeting coming up on the 23rd. And at that meeting, and then the following meeting in July, the um, long range transportation plan is an agenda item. And I know we've been talking a little bit and got some information from Tom Zilla about the route 26 45 flashing yellow light intersection and where that is currently on the long range plan and I, I guess I just wanted to remind everybody that I have that meeting coming up on the 23rd yeah I think it was the 23rd so if there's something that um, we want me to present then um, you know maybe now would probably be the time to discuss that because we don't meet again before that meeting. And I, I read through some of what Tom sent, um, not all of it, not, or not in detail. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely clear on the status of that project on the plan. I think from what I read, it's on there, but it's at the very end. Um, and it doesn't look promising to uh, move it up and or fund it. So that was kind of what I gathered from a quick read. I think I gathered something even worse. And what I gathered was also there are state funding cuts and we can look at, look forward to something like a 38% budget cut or reduction in funding. I'm not sure what the appropriate, like right. less money and that maybe some of those projects might be removed from that long range plan completely. And so um, I guess I'm seeing that there's a mismatch between the plan that the small area plan folks actually are advocating for and that this board was advocating for and that we want to do. Um, a mismatch between that and what's on the long range transportation plan 
And the thing that's on there is way more expensive and in depth than what we actually want to do. So maybe before they cut that, if they're going to cut it, um, maybe we should try to modify it. I know Tom said there was an actual process for it, but I don't know which comes first, the cutting or the process. Um, so before the cutting happens, we want to probably modify that project. Yeah, the other possibility would be splitting out the first part into a separate project and try to get that on as a separate, you know, because the, the one that's out at the end is the actual realignment of the intersection, which right. is a big project. And if we could split out the, the smaller changes as the safety changes mm -hmm. as a separate project. So I, I think that would be the thing to bring into the meeting is the question of is that possible to either introduce it as a separate project or say, well, at this point, we really are interested in this and revise it and- Yes, yeah. okay. I, I would like to keep the other one on if possible out at the end, because the other the other question comes, you know, we may get a big state cut, but there's always a pot potential at any time of an infrastructure bill at the federal level, which suddenly changes everything again. So if it's on sure. there, when that happens, then, sure. you know, mm -hmm. it, it's we still We can have there. that fight in <laughs> fine group yeah. built, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So okay. good. Thanks. Okay, thank yeah. you, that helps. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move to Dave's report. Uh, just a couple of items in my report um, that are worth mentioning here. Uh, first, the uh, three of us, myself and Eric Anderson, the finance director started the implementation process for a financial planning software module that was developed by uh, a group called PFM. Uh, this tool synopsis will help us to apply some different scenario based uh, projections to our overall financial picture and then be able to at a glance determine, you know, what those impacts might look like in the coming fiscal year as well as projected program years ahead. So this will have certainly applications for us as we recover from the pandemic, but also as we go into capital improvement uh, program budgeting, uh, other big ticket budget items, any bond issues that we may be considering in the future, uh, and then last but not least, collective bargaining with the uh, police association. So there's you know, numerous applications that I think will benefit from the use of this tool, and I'll give a, uh, a little demonstration then once we have it deployed and implemented. Um, there are two virtual town halls that are scheduled. One is on the stormwater fee study that's entered the second phase this year. That's recommenced. Um, this stormwater fee virtual town hall is being done in lieu of our planned uh, in-person town hall, which was originally scheduled for uh, sometime late April or early May. Um, that's coming up on June 24th. We sent out postcards township-wide to all property owners. Um, and we are going to have the event live broadcast on CNET. It'll also be um, able to be participated in virtually, uh, or folks will be able to call in uh, with their questions if they have them in real time. But we're encouraging people to submit questions in advance if they have those, and we're already starting to see some of that come in. Uh, we also have a second town hall, virtual town hall scheduled on the disaster recovery effort, scheduled for June 30th at 4 p.m. Um, we are uh, going to be providing a, a number of local and regional updates at that town hall and Centrice is working on scheduling somebody uh, from the Department of Local Government Services with uh, the Department of Community and Economic Development, DCED. So we are finalizing those details um, this week. Uh, and then uh, we recommenced our salary survey uh, with our consultant NJ Hessen Associates. Uh, they were asked to do a traditional salary survey as well as do some analyses on our non-compensatory benefits that we offer at the township and our organizational structure. Uh, once that <laughs> concludes in the coming months, uh, Ms. Hess will be at a board meeting to present her conclusions. That's all I have, unless there's any questions. Any questions for Dave? Uh, what time is the Stormwater Town Hall? Uh, that begins at 6 p.m. 6, okay. I'll open the room at about 5.30. Okay. Uh, then we go to the Public Works Director's Report. You're muted. 
Last week, I issued revision two to the Public Works COVID-19 Work Safety Plan that is attached to the report. Predominantly address, addresses the issue of wearing masks when performing outdoor activities. Staff has been working diligently on the five-year capital improvement plan. I know there's some work sessions planned in the future. I don't know that we settled on a, a, a road tour, but my, my plan was to provide maps and a plan of road improvements and do a uh, virtual meeting and allow you to perform a self-guided tour. We can discuss that further if need be. Public Works road crew activities um, continue. I have some of the tasks listed. Tree Commission met tonight. Agenda topics included uh, ongoing dialogue about the tree preservation ordinance, heritage trees, the official township plant list, and um, just briefly on some other items. Construction work continues on the public works facility. You can start to see um, block walls coming up out of the ground, perhaps as you drive by. Um, most of the foundation work is complete. So block walls, setting steel, those are the major activities coming up in the next two, three weeks. Work continues to be uh, on schedule given the COVID-19 suspension and weather days. Substantial completion date remains November 4th. Project remains to be within budget. Dave talked to you about the town hall that's planned for the stormwater fee study. Uh, in two days, we're having our next meeting of the stormwater advisory committee. So um, I'm pleased to report that uh, I've heard back from uh, every member except one that can attend. So it'll be a, it'll be a well attended meeting hosted by staff or facilitated, but presentations and a lot of good information from our consultant. Uh, hopefully, if you're able, you can uh, listen in on that presentation. We then will have our uh, second stormwater advisory committee meeting to be scheduled uh, next month. But in the interim, in between those two, as Dave mentioned, there is a public education and outreach event on June 24th. Uh, work continues on a number of projects, one of which uh, contract award we talked about. Many of the 2020 capital projects uh, currently in construction. And I believe that's all I had to report. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, Dave, now that Penn State has made their announcement and they're going to have in-residence education and they're um, bringing their staff back to work in a rolled, rolling phase kind of thing, um, is it going to be possible, do you think, to set up the car and pedestrian counting types of things that we need to do for the Pine Grove Mills mobility study and intersection warrant study? I would think yes. That was the big, that was the big what if. So yes. That's very exciting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm assuming State College Area School District will be back in session that's the other um driver of some of that but i don't know i haven't heard what their fall is going to look like so we'll just have to evaluate it based on you know a little bit more information thank you and then if it's the case that we can do it do you know about how long it would take to collect that data like do we have days weeks months worth of data that we have to collect Typically, it's a one-week data collection, not on the weekends, midweek, pick up the a.m., p.m. peaks, usually three days, maybe three or four days. Um, Thank I you. need to check the specifics of what we asked for in this case, but that's, that's a typical time frame. Thank you. 
midweek, not an event, typical average daily traffic. Any other questions for Dave? Uh, Lisa. I just wanted to say thanks to Dave and his crew and um, and the manager for the congratulatory signs for the class of 2020. Mm -hmm. That was really nice to see and that was appreciated. So thank you guys so much for doing that. You're welcome for Dave's. <laughs> okay, then we have the planning and zoning director's report. Yeah, sorry, my internet's going in and out on me. Um, hopefully killing my video will help. Um, I'd say the main things uh, we accomplished, we were uh, met with the Ag Venture Bureau just to review the draft sign ordinance amendments. They provided us with some of their mock-up signs, um, their concerns and hardships that they've had and how the amendments would be addressing those. Um, the manager and I met to discuss the rezoning process via Zoom or depending um, on when it's scheduled, maybe in person, but this was intended to be a joint board and planning commission work session to present planning commission's recommendations to the board for map amendments for the zoning process. So we're still working that process out. Um, Yes, and I attended the tree commission meeting tonight and we were discussing the tree preservation ordinance. They have tentative schedule for edits and comments and hopefully you will be seeing that very shortly. That's all I have. Thank you, any questions for Jenna? Uh, seeing none, we'll go to the chief of police for a report. Thank you. My report is for the month of May. It summarizes the department's activities for the month and year. Our crimes uh, for May are down and overall they're down for the year. Interestingly, our traffic, our crashes, fraud and burglary cases are all down. And you know, a lot of that relates to people are staying home more, so they're driving less and that should has said somewhat impact the uh, burglary calls that we get as well. Over the month, we had uh, several domestic violence arrests. And um, we also had a, a drug related um, incident where a woman was arrested for possessing heroin, meth and marijuana. We had a couple community relation events. One of them, uh, Sergeant Hendrick guest starred, or as I like to say, Zoom bombed a uh, school class with a teacher and students and uh, was very well received by the students. And, uh, and then also next month, I am going to include a chart on our use of force for the department um, for, the, for my monthly reports from this point forward. So if anybody has any other suggestions for my report, I'm more than open to include that information. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the chief? Lisa. Um, just a thank you to you as well. And um, the other officers that were uh, participating in the Ferguson Township Elementary School. Yeah, that, that was pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Percentage. Oh, Lisa. I was going to say, did she freeze up? Oh, she is. <laughs> you back. <laughs> we, we lost you for a minute there. <laughs> there a second. It said a lot of great things. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly a big thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. And Prasenja, you had a yeah. I um, the I was. Uh, I mean, these are small numbers, and we perhaps shouldn't uh, draw too much of a conclusion. But the disorderly conduct um, went up sort of thirty percent, and any uh, clues on what uh, we are seeing more or it's just a random variation? Some of that is fireworks. Um, people are setting off more fireworks as of late. And I think that's a majority of that. Not gonna say all of it, but that's a significant part that we've seen a lot lately this year is um, as I said, people outside setting off fireworks. They're doing it early enough 
in the you know in the uh, day like eight set seven eight o'clock in the evening but it's just as said that it does disturb some people anything else okay looks like we go to communications to the board does anybody have anything that you want to share on this laura yes i do i think i might i can't i I meant to make a list and I didn't, uh, so I have a couple. Um, one, we, we did get a communication about um, the use of a, a device that's very, very smoky in a backyard in close proximity to the other homes. I guess I, I will add to that, that this is not the first time that an issue of pretty serious smoke effects on another individual um, have been brought to this board that I have sat on maybe before others were here, I'm not sure. Um, it, it is a concern for me um, when individuals um, air is quality is being so negatively affected for a long period of time. So I hope we can talk about that, that more. Um, I had another communication from a resident uh, several residents that are talking about a property that they feel isn't being maintained properly. Um, so I'm following up with those residents just to find out a little bit more information about that. Um, I may ask them to come in and just talk, talk to the board in public comment time to get some clarity on what, what they're dealing with. Um, a, a resident contacted me about potentially putting forward another proclamation and um, I wasn't sure what the process was for that. And so Steve let me know that that individual can just email the whole board and we can talk about whether we want to put that forward if a board member wants to put that forward. So we may see something coming from a resident, uh, another proclamation. Um, I think there was one more and it's slipping my mind right now. So, so I'll just send it there. Okay. If you think of it, send it off by email. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. The final thing is calendar items. We have virtual uh, uh, conversation yeah. on July 10th. Ah, Laura's. No, I had. Uh, oh. A Such few a, more. Oh. Uh, so yeah. Oh, okay. I, Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, I had a few um, several emails from uh, constituents uh, uh, related to um, so related to the current situation in several cities uh, with respect to police brutality and so on. And um, right now, uh, I mean, I have I'll possibly do the same thing. That is. Um, ask them to come and speak to the board uh, in the future, um, as Lara mentioned. Uh, but um, I, I think right now they're uh, more focusing on um, uh, State College Borough, but uh, they'll possibly um, come and talk to us uh, uh, afterwards. Um, I have uh, sort of said that I need to find out more, and that's why Dave has uh, Bulka has got a, and, and Chief Albright has got a, um, several emails that I sent trying to find out uh, what we are doing with respect to a lot of things, what our policies are, um, do we allow chokeholds or not, and how train, what type of training our police is, um, ha has gotten, um, and, and do we have people with mental health uh, training, things like that. So I'm at the information collecting stage, some of that was in that uh, um, uh, consent agenda item uh, and so on. Um, so I just wanted to uh, make people aware that uh, there was some uh, discussion on those items. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay, now I'll move to the calendar item is the virtual coffee and com conservation conversation on July 10th at eight o'clock. Uh, I guess the Zoom details will be coming at a township website near you so <laughs> and that seems to be all we have so does anyone care to make a motion to adjourn
I moved. We're adjourned. Catch everybody later. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hi, everyone. Bye.